Good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon devoted to the seismic assessment strategies for masonry structures. Stadata and Tremuri are proud to present you a panel of distinguished professors and engineers from all over Europe. I would like to thank them all for having wanted to share today with us their interesting lectures and case studies. A special thank you to Professor Rita Bento, University of Lisbon, and a more than warm welcome and thank you to Alessandro Marasca, Hopper Engineering, the Netherlands, Alexander Costa, NCREP, Portugal, Jorgozia Antziakiris, Ergocad, Greece, Enning Kirmse, KPPK, Austria, Romina Sisti, University of Naples, Federico II. I would like also to mention our distributors who have worked with us side by side to let you all be today. Ingwer for Switzerland and Austria, Technosoft for the Netherlands, Edisti, Slovenia, Croatia and Serbia, Ergocad for Greece and Cyprus, Anna Shimoes, Portugal. But the greatest thank you goes to Professor Andrea Penna, University of Pavia, who accepted to be the chairman and key speaker for this event. I hand over to you, Andrea. And again, thank you all for being here with us today. Enjoy. So thank you all. Thank you, Simonetta, for your kind words. Uh, and in particular, I thank you all the more, th there are almost 300 participants to this uh, uh, online event that uh, I think uh, uh, is, a, uh, is a sign of the high impact and the high interest that these um, topics that we are discussing today and the very interesting presentation that will be given by the distinguished uh, speakers that um, Simonetta Verdi was uh, mentioning in, uh, in, the, in her introduction uh, will be uh, say the, uh, the topics and the uh, and the uh, and the new features the interesting uh, uh, case studies that will be presented by all the, uh, the presenters. Uh, I, I will uh, say leave uh, now five minutes, allow five minutes for a uh, short, short video presentation that uh, will introduce the uh, Stadata uh, background, the Tremuri background, and the uh, say present and future of uh, these activities, please. STA Data was founded in 1983 by Adriano Castagnone, civil and structural engineer since 1978 and pioneer of scientific software for structural engineering. The company was born to provide civil engineering services and consulting. We have always had a particular interest in the evolving sector of IT, foreseeing the enormous opportunity of applying it in design and computation. Before focusing on software development, STA Data realized important projects both with private and state-owned companies. That's our strength, because besides IT experts, we are professional in structural design. The company is currently composed by 15 employees and several consultants, all highly professional qualified. Thanks to the continuous development of work and collaboration with the university and professional world, it is always able to offer advanced and constant updates to its customers. 
Application SDA Data allows you to face everyday work with simplicity and effectiveness. The company goal does not end with the, research, with the search of new IT solutions. The offer of SDA Data includes support, training and consulting services, including individual projects so that the professionals are immediately operational. Thanks to the technical expertise and the state-of-the-art solution, SETIA Data is the solution to the real problems of designers. Tremuri is the measuring instructor is analyzing specialized software. It is the leader in the world. It is used for existing and new buildings. The software performs non-linear pushover analysis. The mesh is made with the FME method, framed by MacroElement, specially studied for measuring structures to better represent the behavior of measuring structures. Now the software it is available in Italian, Greek, English, German, French, and Albanian, and performs analysis according with Eurocode 6, Eurocode 8, Italian National Code, Switzerland National Code, and the Netherlands National Codes. Tremuri takes origin from Professor Lagomarsino's academy research and actually it is used for this purpose in more than 80 universities. Engineers and companies that use Tremuri for professional purpose are widespread in more than 30 countries. Now let's go through the modeling inside Tremuri. One of the most important characteristics of Tremuri is that it is possible to model floors in, with their real stiffness. As you can see in the picture, this allows you to take into account the correct distribution of the seismic forces on the walls. Um, into Tremuri are available uh, a library uh, of uh, walls and floors and uh, this, in this way, you can uh, easily uh, model this kind of uh, elements. This is, uh, these are the walls that are available in Tremuri. And even if the majority of the floors can be modeled with this library, in Tremuri it's always possible to define directly all the parameter of a floor in order to create uh, your own definition and the real stiffness of the real uh, floor you have in, uh, in the structure. Moving to the vertical elements, several structural uh, objects can be modeled in the MORI, like single uh, measuring wall or uh, reinforced concrete walls, columns and beams, and a combination of walls with beams and tie rods. Into a wall can, can be modeled different materials, different elements, and then uh, can also, they can also have the function of reinforcing the current wall. To reinforce walls into the more you can easily also model reinforced memory, reinforcement between FRP and FRCM. Uh, the mesh uh, inside the MURI is specialized for measuring structures and is made with a fine frame by macro elements method. This method has been studied for uh, the measuring structures to better represent the behavior of a structure made with the, with the main structure in measuring. Using this method, and uh, thanks to the automatic mesh, uh, performed by the software, then the engineer can easily pass from the reality to the model, taking into account a significant, all the significant aspects of the structure. Okay, thank you. I think uh, we have all to thanks the data for uh, hosting these uh, and organizing this event and. Um, uh, this, uh, for this clear contribution they they gave to, to, to the spread of uh, um, of this uh, uh, software and for, of these tools, I think that uh, I, I personally have to to thanks the data because when we started this uh, Tremuri uh, project, Tremuri uh, was born in the university as uh, it was mentioned in the, in the video and. It was uh, something that we were working in uh, uh, during my PhD and um, some previous works and, and then many work uh, which was done afterwards. And uh, we did this uh, in, 
in a very uh, let's say naive way as a in many in many conditions in many situations we do when we work in a, in a university uh, it was very spontaneous then uh, with the help of the data it was possible to transform these I would say brilliant um, uh, research into something that uh, was uh, uh, and um, was sort of into a, 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 a everyday uh, a tool for uh, for engineering practice. I, I think that uh, uh, given these uh, uh, these words that everybody uh, knows, uh, I, I think that we can start with this uh, event. The first presentation, uh, which is a uh, contribution by Professor Rita Bento. Rita Bento is a professor of uh, associate professor at the Instituto Superior Tecnico, the Lisbon, a university in uh, in Lisbon. She is a famous uh, expert in electrical engineering, and uh, she she is very well known in Portugal and but not only in Portugal. Uh, I think that we can then now start with the the contribution, recorded contribution by, by Professor Bento. So good afternoon to all. First of all, I'd like to thank Tadata, the organizers, for having uh, invited me. It's a truly a pleasure to be asked to deliver a speech uh, on this international webinar. So I'm here today to talk about the seismic assessment of the National Palace of Sintra, a study developed from 2018 to 2020, where Tremuri program was the primary software we used. So let's start by talking a little bit about the palace itself with this slide. So the palace dates from the 11th century and it was labeled as a national monument in 1910 and it's part of Sintra's cultural heritage inserted by UNESCO in the World Heritage in 1995. As you can see from the slide, it's a very complex heritage building. It is composed of different reinforced masonry buildings at various intermediate levels, rooms separated by some steps, and the whole space has a layout that somehow um, it uh, reflects uh, the, the, the topography of the, of the place because it was built against the rock um, uh, all over um, the, the, the different buildings. Uh, the number of floors varies from one to six. You have taller buildings and very small ones, and all the buildings have varying perimeter walls of rubble stone masonry. And the type of masonry varies from building to building, and even the same building it varies from story to story. Um, the the rubble stone masonry um, presents different types of stones and dimensions, up to 30 to 40 centimeters long and a various type of airline mortar. The thickness of the perimeter walls of the ground floor, just for you to have an idea, varies from 0 0.35 meter to 2.2 meters. So it's significant um, difference uh, of thickness of the walls. Um, in order to perform a complete seismic assessment of the palace, a multidisciplinary approach was followed with a multidisciplinary team. A historical approach was performed and a visual structural in situ survey. In fact, a significant in situ surveys have been done. Um, this just before to proceed with the experimental campaign. And for the experimental campaign, we have, um, we have started uh, with a geometric survey, with a laser scanner and a, um, a Falcon 8 Plus drone. We have performed ground penetration radar surveys, sample collection for the masonry, flat check tests and ambient vibration tests. 
From the clown's points of turn from with laser scanner and the drone, a 3D beam model was developed in Revit, which includes beyond the geometry, obviously, uh, attributed data of various types uh, assigned to each of to each of the elements of the beam model. So we have considered, we have included in the final model um, historical documentation, description of materials, construction stages, information from experimental in situ tests, and even the main outcomes from the seismic assessment analysis that you have performed in all the palace. Um, um, in this slide, you have only one wing of the palace, the manual in building, and the a cut and the 3D model represent on the right side of the of the slide. So from the laser scanner of the outer and the inner part surface surfaces of the palace, it has been possible to obtain an incredible 3D de uh, definition of the geometry of the structure. Uh, and to illustrate uh, these, just some some results of these of these outcomes. So what we have is the complete geometry of the two massive uh, conic uh, chimneys that we have in the palace. Uh, the possibility to be sure about the thickness of some walls which connect different parts of the palace, just to illustrate the chapel and the kitchen where the weed very completely. Uh, along the, um, the length of the um, wall, or to detect some curves, uh, walls, that it was impossible to, to get it from uh, another um, surveys uh, without using laser scanning. Or even, as you can see from this image, the possibility to get very careful and very precisely the geometry of the roofing, the roofing structures, which consist mainly of timber trusses of different types, so all over the palace, with the, the exception of the kitchen, all the, the buildings have um, uh, uh, timber trusses uh, for hoof. Uh, and I'm completely sure that the obtaining the correct geometry is crucial for the calibration of numerical models and for the quite seismic assessment um, and seismic performance of this type of structures. That's for this type of complex masonry buildings, I think this is the correct way to get the geometric uh, properties of the, of the structures. As far as the GPR uh, surveys concern, uh, we have performed um, uh, these tests not only in the some of the walls where you have removed and, uh, some uh, samples, but also in all the pavements with vaults, just to be sure if they are in fill or not. Uh, and the, in some walls that were built against, uh, against the, um, the rock, just to be sure how was the connection between the wall uh, and, the, the, um, and the soil and the rock. Uh, we have used different uh, frequency antennas and with these we were able to get some uh, important information and to get uh, to be allowed to discover some construction techniques, some types of materials, anomalies like the pre presence of voids, cracks or even water. Uh, for the characterization of masonry, we start with some stamps collection. So it's a qualitative uh, characterization, of course. The location was chosen on the main structural walls that characterize the principal periods of construction of the palace, uh, of course, being aware of the um, countless limitations that we have in a palace because of the existence of uh, tiles of painting. So it's rather uh, tricky to choose the, 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 the place to, to get these, um, these samples of masonry. Uh, the flat checks were carried out uh, uh, preferably in the same walls where you have removed the samples of masonry if not possible in the same wall, in very close walls of, of the walls that you have uh, removed the, the samples of masonry. Um, and the objective was to characterize the mechanical properties of masonry. It is worth mentioning that the inspection windows that we, 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 um, uh, that, uh, we obtained before to carry out the flat check tests 
allow us to, to proceed to the masonry uh, qualitative evaluation. So it was really very important for the qualitative evaluation of the masonry. The flat checks were done with uh, 25 centimeter depth, the size of the flat check. We have here an image of the flat checks used. Uh, so the results obtained with this test were um, considered with caution because you have very thick walls and you are testing just the external um, part of, uh, of the walls. We have performed single and double flat check tests uh, and, uh, and with this, we estimate the actual space uh, of stress in the masonry and, of course, its strength and stiffness. A campaign of ambient vibration tests were performed uh, in the sum of the palace bodies, chosen for their structural importance, existence of damage and history. This test allow to identify the dynamic characteristics or uh, dynamic properties, frequencies and modal vibrations, which in turn were crucial for the numerical calibration of the, of the models. The locations of the experimental in situ tests were representing the BIM model. So we have here uh, the plan view of the manual in building. And um, the main results obtained linked to the model or added uh, to it as attributes. Uh, so we have here some images of the manual in, manual in building and the tests that you have performed um, in, this, uh, in this building. Uh, this film shows uh, how the information related to the masonry samples, flat check tests and the ambient vibration tests have been inserted linked to the beam model. We have uh, the identification of the areas where the masonry samples were removed, where the, the, the tests of flat checks were carried out, including some photos and the main results reached. So for instance, for the ambient vibration tests, location of the sensors and the modes of vibration um, have been um, considered and included in the beam model. In the main model, it was identify all the floors and walls where the GPR tests have been uh, performed, and it was really important. Uh, uh, and the main results as well, as you can see here, linked to the BIM model, the report with the main results of these GPR tests. The mechanical characterization of the materials defined after the realization of the experimental campaign and after the calibration of all the numerical models were also linked to the BIM model. Uh, and here you can see for the same building, manual, manual in building, all the types of masonry and materials that you have considered in the model, as well as the properties that you need to perform the nonlinear analysis uh, in, of the global model um, with the Tremuri program. So let's move now to the definition uh, of the, the seismic assessment itself and numerical modeling of the palace. The, the definition of an effective nonlinear model for the seismic analysis of masonry structural elements represents crucial steps, as you, as you know, uh, towards a proper seismic assessment of existing masonry building structures. For the seismic assessment of the palace, you have considered the in-plan and out-of-plan responses um, of um, the mastery um, and you have performed nonlinear analysis. Uh, considering the size and complexity of the palace under study, wh where this figure is really illustrating the complexity of the palace, I do believe that the macro, macro modeling approach is the tool applicable to large scale, scale computations. Thus, in this study, the seismic behavior was assessed by performing nonlinear analysis through the Tremuri program. This international palace, as I have already mentioned, is characterized by aggregation of bodies, quite clear in this image, um, intensely affected by their dynamic interaction due to the shared boundary conditions. You have all the buildings sharing by each other with some uh, boundary walls. 
the structural model, of course, needs to consider the effects of those interactions. Um, at the beginning of our study, a unique global model of the old palace in the Tremuri program started to be developed, but due to the structural complexity, dimension of the palace, developing a unique model proved at that time to be a computational demanding and uh, we got significant uh, uh, conversions problems and it was almost impossible to calibrate our model based on the experimental results with a unique model. So it, uh, we decided to give up. In the right side of the slide you can see the model when it was decided to stop the development of a unique model of the palace. Therefore, separate models were developed, calibrated, considering all the time the effect of the adjacent buildings and taking into account the field survey and results of the experimental campaign, mainly the ambient vibration tests. They were crucial for the calibration of the different numerical models. So this, we have the identification of all the bodies that we consider in this study with the designation of the names that we gave for all the bodies. I have to say that among all these units, the unit one, the Manueline building, and the 10, which correspond to the kitchen with these two uh, high um, chimneys, um, were the most challenging ones, I have to say, and these were due to different reasons. So, if you move to the uh, Manuelino uh, building, I have to say that this challenging was mainly due to the to the dimension of the building, uh, clarity in plan and in height, different levels, walls without continuity in height. So this was mainly the main reasons why it was so difficult to reach the final model of this wing of the palace. For the, for the kitchen, the unit 10, um, this is mainly due to the presence, of course, of the two massive chimneys with a conic configuration. In this case, we have used different softwares. We start with sub 2000, and this, the, the main reason was trying to have a preliminary uh, outcome, a preliminary um, uh, dynamic characterization of the, the, the building and of the chimneys, because this was rather important to uh, uh, perform the ambient vibration tests and to define the correct localization of the sensors in height. So basically this was the purpose of developing a, a sub-2000 model. Then it was used the Tremuri, but for the Tremuri of course we have model only the effect of chimneys in our building, numerical model. Okay, you have considered all the masses that we have due to the presence of these massive uh, chimneys and the abacus, the lighter, of course, the abacus, um, uh, because you, you, you want to, to study the behavior of chimneys and to get damage part for different seismic intensities uh, of the chimneys, and this was not possible with the tremorim. So, and now to illustrate the type of results obtained, uh, the main results for this Manuelino building and just for the other body call, uh, um, connect to the one, to, to the unit one, I'm going to show very briefly the main results that we obtained. Um, so uh, for the Manuelino building, um, as you can see, we have the building itself here and of course, we model taking into account the constraints imposed by the other building. So this is the other building which connected the manual building at this part, and this is the kitchen which connects as well the manual building. So small parts of these buildings are modeled the ones necessary to obtain the correct dynamic characteristics of the building and the analysis. And we have considered different types of materials described on the right side of the slide. 
support the global seismic assessment, taking into account the in-plane behavior of the walls. We have performed non-linear static analysis with Remuri program. So in this slide, it is represented uh, the damage pattern for the ultimate displacement of pushover uh, analysis for the load applied in both direction, X and Y directions. Um, in fact, the distribution of damage of different messenger walls is represented for the near collapse limit state. Uh, this extreme situation allows us to identify the most vulnerable structural masonry walls and the type of behavior that we are expecting in shear or bending control uh, behavior. Um, so looking to this, of course, you have a significant shear damage uh, and collapse in some of the peers at this intermediate level. So we decide also to just um, uh, represent the most vulnerable uh, masonry walls that are identified in this slide, just the walls who are the first ones in that building who are going to collapse. And we have also considering the out of plane response, sorry, the out of plane response of the, the, the building. The out of plane response was evaluated um, by nonlinear kinematic analysis with Remuri program with the modulo local mechanisms. Uh, but given that uh, due to the very good conservation of the palace in general, no cracking state has been acknowledged. Uh, thus, the identification of possible out of plan mechanism was based on the geometry of the building and its assumptions related to the quality of connections between orthogonal walls and walls and the roof and uh, between the walls and the floors the layout of openings, constructive details and the restraints given by the structure as the, pres the presence of tire roads, all these have been taken into account to define the, the, the mechanism that uh, we have a higher probability of occurrence. So, similar type of study have been done to all the other um, units or bodies that you have divide our palace just very quick what we get for the other uh, buildings buildings bodies two three and four that were connected to that manual in building so these in this slide you have the materials that you have considering considered for this body here again the damage part having performed the nonlinear static analysis for both uh, directions. Once again, we have shear problems for the peers at this intermediate level. Uh, here in this slide, it is represented only the most vulnerable walls and again, uh, the out-of-plane behavior has been considered as well and we have for the same, with the same, um, taking into account exactly the same factors of, uh, that I have already mentioned, we have defined different um, uh, probably mechanism and you have studied this uh, out of plane behavior. So, and to finish in my presentation, just very uh, final comments that I would like to, 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 to give. Uh, due to the complexity of this uh, uh, cultural heritage building, uh, the seismic assessment poses a strong demand on structural engineering skills and, of course, on the available structural analysis techniques. The procedure herein followed seems capable of providing a reliable seismic assessment of such complex structures. Uh, in my point of view, it's a good compromise between computational for effort and um, guarantee a trustworthy assessment. Final, so and the, some related to this last image, we have in this study had to the beam model the distribution of damage of different masonry walls for the near collapse limit state. These have been implemented in the 3D beam model. In this work, we did not explore the Tremuri beam model. This should be explored in the future. And of course, an easy incorporation of these results in the BIM model 
as attributes, uh, enhanced capabilities of BIM, and of course it will be very helpful uh, decision support within the heritage management framework, and certainly will be uh, if you it will be uh, very useful for any management team of this type of, of structures. Uh, and that's all. Thank you very much. So I say virtually thank Professor Bento for her very interesting presentation. Uh, I think that uh, most of us who are who were say, watching their presentation uh, would uh, like to be in her place uh, to to work on this very complex, challenging but really interesting piece of of architectural heritage that uh, is definitely something that. Um, I think uh, she was very uh, lucky to to be involved in with the say, resources to to work and to do the work properly and say to face these very very difficult problems in uh, as a as a uh, say, structural engineer uh, with some say side issues with heritage structures. Uh, the need for analyzing complex buildings uh, with the uh, say uncertain details and certain connection with each other and the very uh, highly irregular both in plan and in leverage uh, I, I think that now we can uh, move to the next presenter who is uh, alessandro marasca he's a structural engineer he's a um, sure, surely uh, uh world famous expert in earthquake engineering in uh, in practice let's say he had the opportunity of working on very very uh, big and important projects and in particular he now uh he recently founded a new company which is hopper uh, he will uh, tell us something about what they do and what they had the opportunity to do in uh, using a pushover analysis of existing measuring structures. Okay, I think you can hear me. Thank you sure. very much, Andrea. Welcome. And I would like to Ciao. share my screen. Okay. No. Sorry. I think now should be correct. Okay. Um, I better before because now we are watching uh, the presenter. Uh, ah. Okay. So it's a little bit in delay. Okay, now it's okay. And I think now you can also see me. Hello. Perfect. Hello. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for the <laughs> well introduction. And uh, uh, I'm very, uh, so I see with uh, very, I saw with very much interest the previous presentation, uh, very interesting project. So I I also prepared a small introduction of myself, but I think Andrea did already a very good uh, work. So I I will uh, I will uh, continue with uh, the uh, following slide. So I would like today uh, to present uh, uh, basically two case studies, um, and in particular the in-plane performance of two typical buildings under induced earthquake uh, in the in the Groningen province. And in order to do that, uh, I, have did, uh, I have divided the presentation in four uh, different steps. Uh, so the four steps, uh, so the first step is basically introducing a little bit the problem. Uh, so the induced uh, earthquake due to the gas extraction. And the following point is a small introduction about the national code. Of course, the presentation is, uh, is very tight, so there will not be too much uh, time. 
And then uh, two basically typical buildings, one terrace house and one detached house. So first of all, uh, for who is not aware, uh, so in the Netherlands and in particular in the Groningen region, there is the uh, biggest uh, gas field in Europe. It was discovered in uh, uh, 1959 uh, and the gas extraction started in 1963. So the gas field is operated by NAM, uh, which is a joint venture between Shell and uh, ExxonMobil. Uh, and basically, uh, since 1980, have been recorded thousands of earthquakes uh, until basically the strongest, which was in 2012, uh, with a magnitude of 3.6. Uh, from that point, uh, basically, a lot of studies uh, started, uh, and uh, basically, the gas extraction was uh, was uh, reduced uh, from 2014. And basically, step by step, uh, uh, we are arriving to today. So the uh, latest uh, uh, news is that the gas field is going to be closed in 2022. So a small note uh, is basically as a gas field is basically first uh, a resource and then step by step a problem. Um, so a small introduction about uh, the in-plane uh, uh, backbones and uh, mechanism and equations included in the uh, national seismic code. So the first one is the flexural behavior. Uh, so the equation is not very dissimilar to the one included also in the Eurocode. Uh, the interesting part maybe is the equation about uh, uh, the drift. Um, the, the, the equation was developed by the Technical uh, uh, University of Delft in the Netherlands uh, with uh, uh, a, a real uh, experiments. And uh, maybe uh, the, so you can get sometimes even 2% in-plane drift uh, for uh, uh, in-plane flexural uh, mechanism. Um, the shape of the backbone is very similar to the Eurogod, so the, to the generally used uh, one uh, in Italy or uh, Eurocode. Uh, a little bit difference in the um, in the shear behavior. Uh, so the bed bed joint sliding, uh, the peak uh, value uh, you can see from the backbone is derived from the generally known uh, equations, and then uh, there is a post peak behavior uh, which is only the frictional part of the equation. Also, uh, an interesting uh, uh, note for this uh, uh, mechanism is the uh, in-plane drift uh, is set for near collapse uh, because everything here is uh, set for near collapse uh, for 0.75% uh, of the effective height. Uh, maybe another important thing uh, I think is the um, is when to stop the analysis. Uh, generally, a 20% of decay is, is used. Uh, in the Netherlands, uh, uh, in the national code, 50% of the decay, so meaning uh, a reduction of the base shear of uh, half. And this is to, the, to basically define uh, uh, the final uh, pushover, pushover curve. So a little bit of insight, uh, uh, because I think it's interesting uh, comparing with uh, what is commonly uh, done in the Eurocode, uh, is about uh, um, the calculation of the demand. So in the Eurocode, uh, as you know, uh, but also in Italy, we generally use the N2 method. Instead, in the Netherlands, it's normal practice uh, to use uh, capacity spectrum method. Uh, the capacity spectrum method is uh, basically uh, a method in which uh, the elastic response spectrum should be uh, reduced, uh, accounting for uh, an extra uh, damping. Um, the damping, the final damping, is basically a sum of the inherent damping, the commonly, uh, the common five percent, and the hysteretic damping, uh, which is calculated and suggested uh, by the NPR uh, by the equations. Uh, and generally, and it cannot be actually uh, 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 bigger than fifteen percent. Uh, so one note is that generally all the buildings have uh, 20 easily a 20 percent uh, uh, decay. Sorry, 20 percent dumping. Um, so uh, acceptance criteria. Uh, so basically, it is an in, uh, an intersection. So the um, the building can be uh, considered 
passing, let's say, the check if uh, the uh, B linear, which is derived, of course, from the capacity curve, can intersect the uh, overdumped response spectrum. Um, so let's move quickly um, to the examples. Um, so uh, who is attending the meeting from the Netherlands uh, will see that this is a very uh, uh, common building in the Netherlands and also in the um, in, in the Groningen province. Um, so this is a terrace house. Uh, terrace house is basically a composition, uh, so a block with more units. Um, it is characterized uh, mainly by large openings in, uh, in the longitudinal direction in the front and back uh, facade. Um, so we have a very weak direction. Uh, the longitudinal and a very strong direction with this which is the transversal um, so the load bearing uh, part uh, uh, is usually the, the transversal walls um, so in this case uh, you can see there are uh, concrete floors uh, but you can easily find uh, a version of this building with uh, timber floors um, the floors are spanning generally from transversal wall uh, to transversal wall um, um, so another uh, uh, peculiarity of this building is the presence of cavity walls in the uh, perimetral walls, so all around. The reason is, of course, uh, for insulation purpose. Um, the inner leaf usually, uh, not always, but usually is composed by calcium silicate uh, bricks uh, with a thickness of 100 millimeters. Uh, of course, there is a cavity gap with a variable measure, it depends. Uh, and then another leaf uh, composed by uh, clay bricks. Um, so the structural part, the load bearing part, is uh, the internal one, so the inner leaf. So for this reason, generally, uh, the outer leaf is not considered in the analysis uh, because the flexibility of the wall ties, which are these elements connecting uh, inner and outer leaf uh, is considered um, so the, the, these elements are considered so flexible that cannot actually engage uh, the outer leaf for the in-plane response. Uh, in terms of other walls, uh, so there are some internal walls, uh, 100 millimeters, so very slender. Again, uh, in this case, but not, it's not always uh, the same. Uh, the um, uh, party wall, so the wall dividing two units is composed by uh, 210 millimeter walls. Um, so what else? So ground floor is a PS insulated ground floor, but generally is always a precast floor. Um, the analysis generally, we start the analysis from foundation level. Ground floor is not considered. Maybe I didn't mention this. Um, I think an important point to mention is the um, the floor. So in this case, this is a, a cast in situ floor, and you can see from this detail that the floor is in between uh, the the walls. Uh, and in this case, uh, it is assumed uh, that can develop a full rigid diaphragm, basically, because the floor is rigid by itself, but also the connections are completely rigid. I didn't mention the roof. I added a few uh, pictures in the previous slide. Uh, the roof is generally timber, and so it is excluded by the analysis. So it is considered as a mass, but not uh, so the well-known and non-structural roof of, of Trimuri. Um, here is just uh, an example on how to go from 3D model to Trimuri model to Trimuri analytical model, in which, as we just said, uh, there is no uh, roof. Um, response spectrum can be um, easily uh, be downloaded from a web tool uh, per street. So some results for this particular binding. Um, so the longitudinal direction is, uh, is governed by uh, flexure uh, because the piers are very, very uh, slender and few of them due to the openings. Um, the, the capacity is quite large, uh, the, um, the spectrum is, uh, there is a dumping of 20% creating an intersection, so the check is, 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 is okay, so the building is okay, so this is the worst combination in X. Um, 
an, imper an interesting aspect of the MPR is that you can account for p delta fx. So basically, when um, yeah you have not too many peers, uh, you can derive a, um, a factor in by which you can reduce the capacity or increase the demand depending in this case uh, uh, we reduce the uh, the capacity completely opposite uh, uh, behavior uh, in the y direction basically the strong direction in which uh, the building is reacting mainly in shear due to the squat walls uh, as we said at the beginning, this is the strong direction, and you can see by the intersection. So the, the intersection with the elastic spectrum is happening at the elastic range, and also in this direction, basically there are no no issues. Uh, this is the summary of the 24 combinations. Uh, they are all fine, basically. Um, another interesting aspect to mention is the possibility to take into consideration torsional effects, so meaning reducing the capacity or increasing the demands with a factor uh, to take into consideration the torsional flexibility of the building. And this can be done according to the MPR with uh, a model response analysis. Uh, as well known, uh, pushover is not enough to provide uh, basically or to have an idea about uh, deficiencies and possibly retrofit measure required for a measuring building. So usually when uh, doing this kind of assessment, uh, 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 we do always a model response analysis uh, to check the roof and the timber components. Uh, uh, and also, as I said, uh, to, cal for the cal to calculate the torsional um, uh, factor, uh, check the existing condition for boundary condition, nonlinear kinematic for out of plane response, uh, check of non structural element, and check of foundations. The second building, the second typology I would like to present is uh, the so called uh, detached house, uh, in which basically they are isolated buildings, uh, mainly uh, one floor. Um, so they present uh, also a different but still a timber roof sometimes the, the roof can be very very complex uh, there is no weak and strong direction clearly so it, 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 it depends by the configuration of the internal walls uh, also for these buildings uh, we can have um, uh, cavity walls or solid solid 100 walls or solid 210 uh, millimeter walls but always quite uh, uh, um, slender uh, um, walls. Uh, a challenge of these buildings uh, to model in Trimuri is that sometimes uh, the walls, some, some of the walls are basically um, below the level of the ground, uh, sorry, of the first floor. Uh, so usually we fixed uh, um, a floor level and then we play with individual peer individual walls in order to match uh, the effective height of the pier since uh, uh, the final capacity of the buildings will be the life will be derived uh, from uh, the effective height uh, same uh, as uh, the previous building we don't model uh, the roof uh, structure um, uh, sorry uh another peculiarity of these buildings is very often they have timber floor so flexible floor uh so it means that comparing with the previous building in which uh, uh, a global analysis is is correct and possible uh, for this type of buildings uh, since redistribution is not guaranteed by the flexible floor we prefer an assessment uh, wall by wall um, yeah in which uh, basically redistribution is not uh, is not taken into account at all. So again, this is shown now to go from a 3D model to a Trimuri model to a 3 Trimuri analytical model in which we don't have the roof. Uh, response spectrum follow the same uh, uh, as before. Uh, results in this case uh, are presented wall by wall, as we said. Uh, this is again. Uh, the one of the worst combination in X direction in which uh, the outcome is positive. Same uh, for uh, a, um, a wall in, uh, in Y direction. And if you want to have a summary 
Uh, here, of course, the combination are more, but they are not the combination, it's just that is a wall by wall assessment. Uh, as you can see also here, basically all the walls are fine. Um, so again, I, I will not repeat, but basically in order to have an idea about the building, also uh, a number of other uh, analysis and assessment uh, and checks uh, needs to need to be done. So finally, some conclusions to wrap up. Um, so along the years, uh, specific advanced studies and analysis were carried out in order to adapt uh, the approach from Eurocode and New Zealand code to the Dutch buildings for the in-plane assessment. Several tests and research programs were carried out along the years to improve and remove conservatism from the Dutch seismic code. Uh, the substantial reduction of gas extraction in the region during the years led to a decrease of the seismic uh, hazard uh, in prevision. Uh, and uh, as a result, despite the vulnerability of the buildings and the walls that I highlighted somehow, there is generally no need for retrofit for the in-plane behavior in the vast majority of, uh, of, of the cases, basically. So that's it. I would like to give a special thank to the uh, reseller of uh, Tremuri in, uh, in the Netherlands, Technosoft, and also to Stadada to have uh, invited me. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. I, I think that uh, many of the, the attending participants, which are who are almost, we reached, the, they are floating, but we reached the peak of almost four, uh, 400. And they, uh, they will be very interested in uh, your presentation and what you have done using Tremuri in uh, such a challenging uh, case uh, as the, the Groningen buildings, because uh, really there the, the will, uh, if we, we, we don't, we start from scratch, from scratch in analyzing these uh, buildings, we, we have a number of difficulties that you probably have uh, sold uh, step by step, also with the help of the, uh, it's a, a special version of the Tremuri program, which was specifically developed for uh, for the for incorporating the NPR uh, requirements and and some let's say uh, guidelines for that uh, you have also developed uh, uh, during these. Uh, uh, years that you have been working on on these because of uh, they say the difficult uh, uh, case of these uh, cavity walls in particular, which is uh, something really um, let's say different from what we are uh, used to have in other in other countries, and uh, and in particular okay, in the in the Netherlands uh, these uh, induced seismicity condition. Uh, also, I think, led to, to 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 make you work with people who were not uh, were totally not aware of any um, let's say um, experience of uh, of, uh, of earthquake engineering and of earthquake uh, at risk in general. So I think that uh, what you have done is really great on on this and this presentation is. Uh, I cannot say I'm completely outside of this because uh, I had also with the youth center a small involvement in this uh, in this project. But this was uh, they say on the research uh, side. But you you were really facing the day by day issues of practice in uh, and modeling and finding solutions applicable every day, for, both for the assessment and for the retrofit of these of these structures. Thank you again. Thanks to you. So I think we can now move to the next presenter. The next presenter, okay, I'm really happy to to introduce because uh, uh, Alexandre Costa is uh, first of all he's a friend. Uh, I have to thank him publicly because I just received like, uh, some bottles of Porto from from him. No, I'm, <laughs> it is it is true, but I'm joking. <laughs> Uh, no, he's uh, um, uh, a big expert in existing buildings, in, uh, in particular what concerns the seismic assessment and retrofit of existing buildings. So he has been working on this topic, uh, generally speaking, since uh, 
many years, I say, I would say now. Um, I, I, I met Alessandro when he, he was a master student and uh, I, I've been uh, so, so lucky to be his, uh, one of his um, uh, advisor of the uh, PhD thesis as well. Uh, he did uh, this is his master at the Rose School, the famous Rose School in Pavia, and then uh, he did his uh, PhD at the uh, equally famous uh, uh, Faculty of Engineering at the University of Porto. So uh, he is uh, one of the founders and partners of the this company, which is called NCREP, and I think that Alessandra will show us what they are doing uh, and they, what they are they start what they, they actually have started to do in a systematic way in uh, in Portugal. Thank you, Alessandra. Thank you very much, Andrea, for your nice words. And also, I'd like to thank you for the invitation to be presented in this quite interesting seminar. So, can you hear me perfectly, I hope. And yes, Alex, we can hear me very well. Okay, perfect. Can you see, can you see my, my screen also? Exactly, exactly. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you uh, for your words, Andrea. It is a pleasure to be also a, a friend and also to to face my 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 period of and also my my career with yours. I think it was quite interesting to work together in Pavia, and also we are still working together. I hope we can do it also in the future. And also I like to thank to Stadata for this quite interesting seminar, and uh, I hope that with this presentation uh, that is entitled Challenges on the Seismic Assessment and Strengthening of Traditional Mainstream Buildings, I will expose and also show briefly what we have been doing in this area in the last years. So my presentation is divided in four uh, main points. The first will be the small introduction, then we'll pass also to the, the, the presentation of some applied research and developments that we have been doing with Remuri. And then we'll pass to the main scope of this presentation, that is to describe our methodology and also uh, with the application to two case studies and in the end, some final remarks on this uh, subject. So as and Andrea was saying, I'm also founder and partner of NCREP, Consultancy on Rehabilitation of Built Heritage. We are a spin-off from the University of Porto. We are uh, now, this year, this year we are 10 years old. And you are a group of civil engineers with advanced formation in the field of existing constructions with master and phd degrees and we have also currently a strong collaboration with laboratories and international research groups our main services are four that can be divided in the inspection and diagnosis also the structural health monitoring passing through seismic assessment and in the end the design of rehabilitation and sustainable projects of different type of constructions Take into account a good network that we are be doing from, from research in, in Portugal, but also in Spain, Belgium, and in Italy. And indeed, we, with a very good collaboration that we had been developing with the University of Pavia, been, we have been doing uh, uh, several works on the characterization of the seismic behavior of traditional masonry buildings in low seismicity regions. Uh, we have been working mainly in Porto, and this last year we have been also able to do some work in the city of Liège in Belgium. Uh, the approach was similar, so we started from the selection of the most representative building archetypes. From these ones, we develop and we, well, we didn't develop, we calibrate the macro element parameters to simulate the in plane behavior for these type of buildings, and then we pass through the analysis of typical buildings from these two cities. These are seven models that we used in Porto region. And we, based on these models, we did linear static assessment with Ramuri. And also uh, from there, we analyzed the, origin, the buildings on original conditions and then also on retrofitted ones. And then we validate these values, these results with nonlinear dynamic analysis take into account uh, the flexibility of the, the, of the diaphragms and also 
making use of, of these models with this this is a work that we just finished this 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 year we passed to the seismic assessment of freestanding elements as for example chimneys parapets at the top of the of these buildings so we could also apply nonlinear static assessment and nonlinear dynamic analysis to evaluate the seismic performance of this type of buildings. This, have been, this has been, been doing also with a great collaboration with Professor Andre Pena, making use of Tremuri. And we applied more or less the same uh, approach for these uh, two buildings that are like uh, three and two and three four, uh, story buildings typical of the edge that can represent more or less 25% of the habitational buildings within the city. So uh, one of the, our main purposes is to continue developing new tools or at least increase the knowledge in the area of existing construction. So we, then we can apply some of these concepts in our uh, daily base designs. In this case, the last point was to derive fragility curves and perform risk analysis for the city of Liège. Concerning the, 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 this methodology that we applied for assessing the assessment of existing structures. So we starting always from the characterization of structural systems. Of course, you already know this, but at least let's rephrase this again. Then passing through the complete inspection and diagnosis, then passing through the mechanical characterization with non-destructive and semi-destructive tests on masonry and then also on timber, uh, reinforcing concrete or steel elements in the case if we have it and then concerning the calibration mainly of the numerical models we use also the model identification techniques with alien vibration tests and <clears throat> with all this information we develop our numerical models specifically for the seismic assessment where Tremuri is our main software concerning masonry structures with all with all, all these elements we are able to define the best strengthening solutions for each type of building. Let's also make some overview of the what is the actual conditions in Portugal. Uh, despite we have been working and we know that Europe collates, we uh, use all around Europe, in Portugal it is just a, as a legal uh, normative since 2019 and since 2019 it is mandatory to perform the seismic vulnerability assessment reports for existing buildings. However, we have been using Tremuri since 2016, and one of the cases that I'm going to show you is the first building that we uh, simulate making use of Tremuri. What are our, our main challenges? Are main, basically the definition of um, masonry mechanical properties for seismic assessment, because there is not a, a, like a huge database that we can consult, for example, as you have it on the uh, Italian normative, we have where you have very good indications of the masonry properties. In Portugal, we don't have this type of information. So what usually we do, we make a literature-based definition with a special relevance to the Italian normative. And also we use uh, our database that we are still uh, increasing. We have now uh, almost 50, for example, 50 double flat check tests performed on different type of uh, masonry uh, structures. And our main goal is to continue to increase this database so we could uh, we can more specifically um, select the best mechanical properties. So take into account all this element and all this information I'm going to show you the, these two case studies. One of what, the, the first one, the same strengthening of uh, an existing uh, old palace in Olivellas. It is that this one on the left and on the right i'm going to show you a seismic performance assessment that we made for a building at the build at lisbon downtown both of these buildings are what we can be consider it moderate to high seismic hazards from 0 0.25 to 0 0.3 uh, g of pga due to the soil type of the in the, for these buildings soil type c for the left building on the left and soil type d for the building on the right and in Portugal, we must work with uh, both type of earthquakes, so earthquake type one and earthquake type two. Concerning the first case study, <clears throat> so we have a ground floor, first floor, and also the attic that was used during the, all these years. 
And uh, this is a building that with the estimated date of construction uh, on the 18th century with a total area of construction of 780 square meters. It is a traditional masonry and timber structure and it was abandoned since 2005. Uh, what were the main challenges in this, uh, this building? Despite being uh, low, it is not a very high building, it's a very low building, but one of the, the main challenges is what to be used as a museum. Uh, and we'll see afterwards what were these implications on the design. And also we have flexible diaphragm with timber floors. And uh, one of the major problems of this building was the presence of a severe termite attacks. This is, for example, a wall in the last floor. This is a, a lightweight timber wall fully attacked with termites. You can see it on the right. So this means that the uh, timber elements were with, uh, in a bad state of conservation. Uh, one, uh, let's say that in the end, this was a problem, but the major problem was that at the first floor, so between the ground floor and the, the attic, the roof, we have all these walls that has mural painting. So this, this, were, this was a, a major problem in this case study. So these walls were painted and one of the main purposes of this intervention was to keep the first floor exactly as it was. So the uh, floorboards, walls, also all the wooden elements and if possible, also the, the ceiling. And then we decide how to do it, how to analyze it, and then how to strengthen to keep all these elements. So this is just a presentation of the structural configuration. We have at the, uh, at the perimeter uh, walls, there were uh, stone masonry, a regular stone masonry, basically uh, mainly on limestone, uh, limestone. We have also some internal walls on masonry, and then we have some more timber framed uh, walls that were also used as load bearing walls. This is for the ground floor. This is the first floor structural plan. You can see this, the alignments of the timber elements. And here at the bottom, we have the structural intervention based on the inspection and diagnosis phase and considering also the vertical load. So you can see it clearly that this area in the back, it was in the best state of conservation, while this five compartments at the front were those ones that had those uh, moral, moral paintings. So the main points was to keep this, these areas as they were, if possible, of course. So why did you select Tremuri first? Was that with this um, software, we could take into account the nonlinear behavior of the masonry, making use of the nonlinear static procedures that we can analyze this type of buildings. Also, we, we like it very much because it's a very simple and fast modeling for assessment and design of strength interventions. And it is possible to uh, evaluate the evolution of damages and detect also vulnerable areas. Also, as we have the problem of the diaphragm's flexibility, we could also assess the influence of the diaphragm flexibility in the, in the, with different type of solutions. So what came out from this uh, this analysis was that the original structure did not possess sufficient seismic capacity. And for, in order to improve this type of behavior, we simulate different diaphragm flexibility, where we derive it in increase, uh, improve significantly the global behavior of the building. And then we have also the problem of uh, masonry mechanical properties that they were not enough to sustain the seismic actions. So we simulate also different type of intervention as wall injections, mainly on the uh, masonry walls and also reinforced the concrete plaster that we, again, we didn't want to use it, but we just want to assess the, the efficiency of this type of uh, intervention. All these improvements were made based on the masonry properties that the, 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 the improvements that comes from the Italian code. This is an image for the same displacement for a pushover analysis along the x direction, so along the main facade. We can see here 
the the the, the main facade damage pattern you can see it, that we have uh, like some damage concentration here on the on the edges some more damages at the bottom and also some uh, failures of elements along the building and you can see it that on the strengthening structures mainly based on the the stiffening of the diaphragm, some improvements of the masonry properties, we could have a more spread damages and with not a lot of damage concentration on certain elements. <clears throat> Taking these to account, we, 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 we have here some images of intervention. So for example, the application of syntec anchorage systems at the corners, at the edges, so we could connect perpendicular walls also same improvements of the diaphragm stiffness how did we do it so we took into account the existing timber elements that were in the best set of conservation but we introduced intermediate sports so we could maintain these elements so we could keep the floorboards at the upper floors and making use of horizontal timber trusses we increase like the the stiffness of the diaphragm due to uh, under shear forces under distortion forces also connecting all these elements at the perpendicular walls we were improving also the connection between horizontal and vertical elements this is an image at the top of the ground floor and this is an image at the top of the first floor so we have a new timber um, floor uh, for the attic and we use a double layer of osb strain boards so we, we were improving also the shear stiffness of the diaphragms. Concerning the global behavior and local behavior of masonry, some of the masonry elements, you can see here images from the ground floor, they were reconstructed, you making use of timber framed walls. These, uh, these, is, these are some images from the walls, uh, so from the demolished part that was not in a good state of conservation. And they were supposed to be injected but during the, the construction works, in the end, it was decided not to go for a museum, but to just go for a, a more common office building. And it was, in the end, possible not to use injections to improve the seismic behavior. And here's some local reconstruction of also of the timber floors, of all the, the frontal walls. And now some final images, just to figure out what can be done. So we can see here that all this, these paintings were maintained these are the original floorboards the roof the ceiling was reconstructed this is the same compartment did it before and after the intervention and it came out that with Remuri we were able to keep the building as it was the, our main purpose is as it was to keep the first floor so the second case study i'd like to show you is a typical building from lisbon and it is a, a five-story high building. And it was with a possible date of construction in the late of the 19th century. And it has a total area of 6,500 6, square meters. Also with a traditional timber masonry structure. So you can see here on the right and mainly at the perimeter walls of limestone uh, masonry walls. The inner core also of uh, masonry walls, and then we have some intermediate walls that are load bearing walls that now we'll see how are they built. So what were the main challenges here? Was the, the extensive inspection and diagnosis campaign to characterize correctly these uh, masonry elements, so in order to model it correctly. Also the mechanical characterization that we may use with the uh, flat check tests, also some cores and then we also evaluate the dynamic behavior of the building, making use of ambient vibration tests. And this was a problem because it was a corner building and, and this could be a problem that we need to address and to assess with the seismic analysis. Uh, the final occupation of the building was to be used as offices. So take into account all the information, we start doing the work. And one of the first points was that we figured out that these are some images from the late 19th century. And until 1940, the building was just three story high. So in the middle of the, of the 20th century, it came up with more two stories. Also, another surprise was that 
these external and the inner core walls, they were built on masonry walls, on masonry, but the internal load bearing walls were made on timber, mainly timber elements that were supporting all these five stories. So what we used was to we develop we used two numerical models, one finite element model for gravity loads and also to assess some local or global behavior for lateral loads, but then we used Remui for the seismic evaluation of this type of buildings. On the right, you have the uh, model identification first model of vibration for the three models, second model of vibration for the three models, and from this on, we calibrate our numerical models in order to do the seismic assessment. What <clears throat> was used in our Tremuri model was to assume only masonry walls as primary seismic elements, as you can see it here. So these intermediate walls were not introduced due to negligible contribution to, uh, to the seismic resistance. We have been some doing some works in this area and in the end, uh, all the, the stiffness and the strength of the masonry is not is too, too big to be able to distribute the seismic forces for other vertical elements. So <clears throat> what came out with the linear analysis with the file element method was to evaluate some local problems mainly due to vertical loads for example this it was a large opening at the ground floor this is from from the here in the middle this is at the inner core where we have big steel profiles supporting like a four-story height walls so we use it mainly for vertical loads we try to understand what came out uh, concerning uh, horizontal loads but in the end Remuri, was fundamental so we can we could introduce correctly the overall uh, properties of the building we with remuri we were able for example that we were not able with the finite element model to um, identify a problem of a stop, soft story mechanism at the front facade and also at the inner core walls this area over here also it was a, a big problem due to the not, uh, not existent of continuity along the height. We try also to simulate some different uh, solutions of strengthening, but in the end, only shear walls with coupling, beams, with coupling beams were able to uh, retain some of the seismic forces and from then uh, keep some seismic forces outside from the masonry walls. So, as final remarks, uh, I would say just uh, that. Indeed, before starting to go for a deep uh, seismic assessment of an existing building, it is in, quite important to do a complete inspection and diagnosis. And of course, that when we are doing, when we are working with existing masonry buildings, inland linear behavior is fundamental. And for these purposes, of course, Tremuri comes with a fast and efficient tool for the linear seismic assessment. Uh, just as a final comment, what we have been facing is that for these massive masonry buildings, we have a very difficulties to change the primary seismic system, system from masonry walls to other type of systems. So what came as an, as the next challenge that is coming in the next few days, next few, mo few months, is going to be the, the modeling, the seismic assessment model for these monastery of Olivellas and of course, Tremuri will be again our main software. I let you also hear with the uh, Anna Simões contact that is a Portugal uh, uh, re the, the representation in Portugal of Tremuri. If you need something, just contact him. And also, thank you, Stadata, for this uh, nice seminar. And if you have any question, please just let me know.
I had lost the control of my microphone. So, so uh, I, could, I couldn't tell anything about <laughs> your very, very interesting presentation. And I think uh, that uh, I did the, the, the right choice in uh, skipping many case studies in my presentation because uh, the presentation you have presented together with uh, Alessandro and uh, Rita so far, but probably the others as well, will be much more interesting and, uh, and nice <laughs> like mine. So I think it is, this was a good choice in this sense. Uh, thank you again because of uh, this. Uh, uh, clear illustration of what you have done, reasons, results, uh, methods used that was, I think, very, very interesting. I'm pretty sure that there will be questions for you in the last uh, part of this, uh, of this webinar, uh, where we, when we will have the, the question time. Uh, I, I really thank you again for uh, sharing your uh, very interesting uh, experience and and also for the good use you did of these uh, tools because this is also something thank you very much so i think that mm, we can now uh, pass to the mm, the next uh, presentation which is a contribution from greece uh, this uh, contribution is from george uh, tsentsiakiris uh, who is a civil engineer but he's also one of the resellers in, uh, in Greece of uh, Tremuri. He works for this company ErgoCAD. And he will, in his presentation, is focused on uh, a case, uh, another interesting case study uh, of a two-story masonry building in, uh, in Kos, in the Kos Island in, uh, in Greece. We, mm, there will be a part related to assessment and a part related to interventions. Good evening, everyone. My name is George Yamsiakiris. I'm a civil engineer, and today I will present you a case of a construction study located in Greece, and more specifically on the island, of course. Before I begin with my presentation, I would like to make a quick recommendation for our company, ErgoCAD, which is the official distributor of the Tremori software in Greece and Cyprus. ErgoCAD was founded in 2007, and this day, distributes and promotes specialized software solutions in many countries in Europe and also in Australia. In addition to our official website, www.ergocat.eu, we run five other websites related to specific software. In 2015, we started our collaboration with Standard Company in Tremuri, one of the most innovative software for the analysis of structures built in masonry and mixed materials. Since the first moment, we were impressed by the easy of use of pushover analysis and special tools, such as verification of local mechanisms. Tremuri quickly became known in Greece and Cyprus, and NergoCAD was recognized as the best distributor internationally in 2016 and 2017. Today, Tremuri is used in various engineering universities for the preparation of diplomas and dissertations which you can find on this page. Those who are interested can find an ebook we created for Tremuri, which includes provision for the Euro codes and the Greek regulation for building made of masonry, named CADET in Greek language, which is under development. On our YouTube channel named ErgoCAD, you can also find the recording of a five hour conference that took place at the 16th European Conference on Earthquake Engineering, organized in Thessaloniki, Greece, in June of 2018. The building that I will present you is a two-story building on the island of Kos, built in 1929, which showed damage after the earthquake that occurred in July of 2017. At the bottom left, you see how the mathematical model appears in Tremuri. In this case, we used almost all the available Tremuri tools you see on the slide. Due to a law that applies to earthquake-affected buildings in Greece, we had to use the linear analysis to 
subsidize the owner for the damage to the building. In the final control, of course, we use pushover analysis, even comparing the individual scenarios of pushover with each other. First and foremost, we verified the geometry of the whole building and every element, and all the laboratory tests were done to find the type of masonry. From various parts of the building, we discovered that it had two layers walls consisting of volcanic rock, mar, limestone, and limestone. These photos are from the building. We can see here that there is an existing tie road on the walls. And finally, we received as the characteristic compressive strength, the value FK of 3.05 megapascal. At the same time, we categorize the damages of each wall based on the categories provided by the Greek regulation for earthquake damage buildings. On the left, we can see the four letters, the four categories, A, B, C, D, and on the right, the ground floor plan and the first floor plan. In this slide, you can see again the floor plan of the ground floor and the fixing of the damages. The studies were done by Mrs. Halkidu and Mr. Sifonios. Here we see the categories of its damage. The sum of the damages led us to the conclusion that this is a global failure and not a local one. So it was necessary to proceed with a global analysis. As we mentioned earlier, we had to use the linear analysis because the building was built before 1959 and to insert the seismic forces as horizontal loads to the center of mass of every level with the same value. This is the formula we used where epsilon is taking the value of 0 0.14 of G and Ni are the vertical loads of each level. For newer buildings, the distribution is different as it's showed here on the right. So we performed the linear analysis and noted the points where the damages appear on the walls. The goal was to then perform the operations on the damage elements and to check if they are sufficient or if due to operations failures in other elements occur. Let's see the steps of this procedure. First step, we check the existing building before the damages. We get the results and we continue with the second step. Now we have to repair the damaged elements and check in the same time of the remaining undamaged elements. These are the interventions. First, we remove partially the mortar, install injection tubes at the distance of 30 to 70 centimeters with a diamond shape. Then we have the Limepore IZ8 injection, which contains natural hydraulic lime because we couldn't uh, apply uh, mortar based on cement. Then we add facet grout with Kimia Tectoria M10 mortar. And finally, we have the application of Chemistil Connect and the wall mesh MR system in two directions. We have to measure that according to the new Greek regulation for the intervention of treasury buildings, which is named CADET, it is under development as we mentioned earlier, the application of deep pointing from three to five centimeters increases the compressive strength at about 15 by using this formula and about seven when we apply injection grout by using the second formula. 
In our case, we use both of these intervasions plus the wall mesh MR system. And for this reason, we increase compressive strength of the wall and the shear strength at about 15%. In this slide, we can see the materials. We have the Kimia Tectoria M10 mortar, the lime pore, the wall mesh MR, and the Kimi Steel Connect. We also added new brick units and steel bars on the intersection of walls where we had significant damages. Through the next slides, we can see the whole process. The images are not from the real project, but from the brochures of Kimia and Synteco companies. First, we cut out the mortar from the joints. We drilled the wall and we installed the tubes and fastened them on the wall by using beton fix. And we inject lime pore, which is acceptable for historical monuments. Some days later, we started leveling. We prepared the mortar, we laid down the first layer, and then we make it smooth. We put the mesh and we embedded it. Later, we drill the wall and we insert the connectors and we lock them. Finally, we overlay the connectors and apply the final layer of plaster. During the same second step of analysis, we decided to add a new layer with wooden planks in order to improve the displacement of the first floor. After the analysis, we had some failures on undamaged elements, so then we decided to replace the existing timber floor of the second level with a concrete slab, and we added concrete beams on the external walls. Finally, we applied the reinforcement, putting a vertical and horizontal mesh of rebars of uh, eight millimeters diameter every 15 centimeters. You can see on the right with the blue uh, color the wall mesh MR application and with a Greek color the um, reinforcement with uh, steel bars. In addition to linear analysis, we ran a static analysis for the verifications of vertical loads as they are described in Eurocode 6, where all the walls had enough bearing capacity. We can see the results here. We also run a model analysis in order to determine the node which has the maximum displacement. This could be the control node of the pushover analysis. And because we wanted to find the percentage of the mass which is effective for each mode, and later we check the walls through a seismic analysis for the out of plane bending. As we can see, all the colors were green, that means that all the checks are satisfied. As we explained earlier for the linear analysis, we took a ground acceleration of a zero point 14 of G because of the Greek regulation. The real ground acceleration because of this earthquake was estimated at about 0 0.6 to 0 0.20 of G. We collected the, this data from the website www.itsac.gr. And for this reason, we decided to run additionally some scenarios by using pushover analysis. For the pushover analysis, we took a peak ground acceleration of 
0 0.24 of G, which is the value according to the current seismic zones of Greece. We run analysis first for the existing building. And as we can see on the diagrams, the A factor, which is the ratio of PGA of each limit state for um, each pushover analysis to uh, 0 0.24 G is over the one except the damage limitation state for the X direction, which is 0 0.9. On the opposite, all the factors for the pushover on Y direction are under the one value, as we can see in this diagram. Here we present the results after the applied interventions. We see that all the A factors are over the one except the damage limitation uh, factor on Y direction here, which remains on a low level. But since the decision of the owner was to check the building for the severed damage state, we didn't go farther in analysis. Also, we have to uh, note that the maximum displacement of the existing building was 1.63 in x direction and 98 in y direction. After the intervention, we had 2.65 and almost 3 in y direction. Based on the results of another pushover analysis where we used ground acceleration of 0 0.14 of G, similar to the linear analysis, we can say that the total cost of intervention could be reduced at about 30%, comparing to the conservative results of the linear analysis for the same ground acceleration. It is worthwhile to mention that Remuri gives a lot of tools to the end user. In this case, for example, we run pushover analysis for all the main direction and centricities of the 3D model, 24 in total, but we also run additional analysis for more direction in order to verify how the structure uh, reacts to the direction of the real seismic force. Some other useful tools of Tremuri are presented here. We can compare the pushover curves, the different scenarios of intervention in order to find the most efficient in terms of cost. We can see the stresses at, under each wall, or we can uh, run pushover analysis for every single wall, assuming that it is isolated from the other elements. We also, in this example, check how the structure can be responded if we divide it in two parts. The results were obviously better, but the division is not acceptable because of the region where the structure is built. One of the advantages of Tremuri is the tool of local mechanism, which helps us to check every single part of the walls for the out-of-plane behavior. You can see here an example. On the left, there is a failure. For this reason, we inserted some tie rods or we replaced the existing ones on this structure. You can watch a detailed webinar for local mechanism in Greek language in our YouTube channel. In conclusion, we need to mention that there are some parts of Eurocode 8.3 which lead the engineers to use pushover analysis. These parts are on the opposite direction of the Greek regulation for the damaged masonry buildings, but we hope in the future there will be a common solution for these types of structures. More specifically, in, in Eurocode, 8.3, the application of linear methods 
has to follow these conditions. The floors possess enough in plane stiffness and sufficiently connected to the perimeter walls. Floors on opposite sides of a common wall have to be at the same height. Walls are continuous along their height. And lateral load resisting walls are regularly arranged in both of horizontal directions. If you check this images, for example, you can see that the buildings on the right are not valid for the application of linear method. The same in uh, this slide. Non-linear methods should be applied when the conditions are not met. Since all the existing masonry buildings have floors made of timber, it's not possible for the engineers to use linear analysis, and it is something that has to be solved in the future. In this last slide, we can see some of the most important companies in Greece and Cyprus that have already invested in Tremuri. Okay, I think uh, this uh, presentation was also very interesting, and in particular, it is interesting to compare the different approaches uh, and the different code regulations that still are uh, in, implemented in different European countries. Uh, besides, we have a common code, which is Eurocode, then uh, the national uh, regulations can be very, very different. Uh, the same applies uh, in particular for the presentation by Alessandro Marasca was, uh, say, uh, showing the application of this uh, uh, Dutch code that was uh, actually partly, partly derived from, uh, uh, from Eurocode, but also with some influence from the New Zealand and uh, uh, US codes. I think we can now move to the next uh, presenter, which is uh, Henning uh, Kimse. Uh, from Austria. I think that there will be some other interesting uh, case studies and uh, uh, analysis that they will uh, show us. Thank you, Henning. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I feel very honored to be invited also to that event by Ingwer and Stadata. And I want to switch. Can you hear me? I guess it's fine. Yes, we, yes, we can hear okay. you. I can, okay. can see you. Okay. Uh, okay. Still not the your. Okay. Screen must be there now. We we see it as well. Okay. Go on. Yeah. <clears throat> um. Yeah. I, because um, I understood it as an interactive exchange, so. I don't want to go so much in detail. I just uh, had the idea to to present a little bit how is the situation in Austria, especially in Vienna, what types of buildings we have, what is mostly our task, what we have to do there. So um, the, our company, KPPK, is consulting engineers for civil engineering, we are not only doing structural engineering, uh, building services, fire protection and everything. And so mostly clients want to have the whole field of engineering when they are coming with a project to us. The typical masonry buildings in Vienna, I mean, I'm just talking about 80 or 90% are mainly built around 1880 until 1920. And they are typical 
construction parts, art ceilings, measuring above the cellar normally. And in upper stories, mostly you have wooden beams and walls, of course, masonry walls. Sometimes there have been changes, but mostly you find buildings like that. And then our planning tasks consists also mostly of typical things, removal of walls, addition of an elevator or parking garage. And of course, last but not least, uh, the attic conversion, which is the most typical thing. And addition of elevator and parking garage is coming mostly together with it because this is, um, is bound together from from the authorities because if you want to build up a attic conversion it is a must that you have to build an elevator and parking garage also so that means in that case you have to take care of all of these, these parts the material part is mostly tested in situ tests sometimes they're also taking some some parts of the bricks and the mortar but it is mostly done in situ test and you can see these are more or less the, the the characteristic value i was writing there which we found here to typical floor plans this is the most standard case you can say where you have the outside walls street wall is one here then you have a middle wall and the back wall you can say on the, on the garden side or courtyard side and all these beams which we have mostly the wooden beams in the ceilings are from the outside walls to the inside walls so that means that walls are the main walls for that buildings this is the main typical floor plan and there are slightly some other typical this is that one this is like a corner building type which causes very often here in that corner some problems in my experience um next one which also very often is the typical two houses with in between the staircase then it can be like the on the left side where you have the staircase uh, directly but then you have a split level between the two houses and the other possibility is like it is on the on the right side where the staircase is rounded and so you don't have any split level there so that is what i told before already the main walls are all the loads going through that main walls that means uh, and these are secondary walls in the y direction main walls i can add these uh, typical sizes are around 60 centimeters in the upper stories they will a little bit less like 45 except middle wall middle wall is you can say 60 centimeters from from the uh, ground floor to the to the attic level because there are also chimneys inside very often so that secondary walls are the walls to the to the neighbor on that side that side which are mostly 30 centimeter and in the attic level then only 15 and the staircase walls are also like 30 or 45 and then this special thing these extra walls which are rectangular to the to the outside walls that are very thin walls they don't take any loads they are just for the uh, for the building there in between and these walls are mostly the the important factor then there are some different ground views you can say this is a combination of the of the standard one with a small part on the back side this is a huge type of two buildings with two staircases or 
a corner building with a, a small part on the backside with also two staircases. But all these different ground views you will see are similar in, in wall thickness and, and, and ceilings. Yeah, also with the, sometimes you will find uh, uh, houses with the courtyard inside and the house is going around. And this is a special big one, what is going around and has uh, um, also a circular corridor here inside. What is going on? This means you have this staircase here, a staircase here and here, and all is connected with one corridor, which is going around. Ceiling constructions. We have also very typical wooden beams. Of course, this is the standard which you find in almost every house. These are typical between 20 to 26 centimeters. Sometimes, sometimes can be also the height a little bit more, 30, but this is really seldom. This is a very massive one. I just put it here because it was a nice picture. This, I must say, is a old building which is a little bit older than what I mentioned before. So that is a very massive ceiling. And then we have that uh, dipple bomb ceiling. I did not translate that because I was not sure was the <laughs> what could I find in English. That means you have one wood to the to the other, and they're connected with uh, solid wooden pegs. So that gives that construction a very solid type. They are found. This is found mostly as the last level above the third story or so you can say you will find very often this type of ceiling ah yeah and then we have also sometimes in the later part of the period you will find not only wooden beams you will find steel beams and between that steel beams you will have the wooden beams steel beams then have a distance three meters or something like that. So the wooden beams inside that are a little bit smaller than before. Of course, then vaults and art ceilings of masonry, this is mostly found in the cellar or above the uh, ground floor. Sometimes in bigger buildings, you will find it also in almost every floor. And typically is um, the, the ground of the bathrooms or something like that are mostly built up with that ceilings. Yeah, this is also a cellar type vaults, which is typical to find. And then strengthens construction did mostly done by the composite structure, wooden beams and concrete slab, small concrete slab around eight centimeters, which gives that ceiling a very stiffness so that you connect here all walls of the building in that in that area of that of that um, ceiling then i must say the by the authorities be, until 2008 or so there was a, a standard here regarding the seismic loads and then from 2008 started the area of the EC8. And in the beginning time, it was a very difficult thing with the attic conversion because it was not clear how to, to, to do that in a static, static analysis. And then in 2013, it came the new national annex. And here, it was found um, the possibility. It is similar to the to the Swiss standard because all the buildings they don't have the hundred percent earthquake resistance. So, or it's really rare to find that. So that means we have to see what's the resistance of the existing building and what's the resisting 
after the construction. And this is also done before by with a reliability analysis. I just try to uh, translate a little bit and put some example. That means we have to you have to calculate a number of persons who are in the building. This is in different categories. Let's say 10 flats and there are 2.35 persons each flat. And then there's also a time factor, which is in case of the of the flat is one. So it means in that building with 10 flats, you have to calculate 23.5 persons. And then you are building up in the attic story, two flats, let's say, then this will be higher. And this I marked here, there are 4.7 persons more in the building. That means, and that uh, standard is saying, you have to see what is first the seismic resisting factor, let's say, for example, 40% of the existing building. Then you have a probability of, of breakdown existing building and the number of persons existing building, which we had here. And then with that curve, which is also like in the Swiss code, uh, you have a, a correlation between the seismic resistance factor and the probability of a breakdown. And then you're calculating it in that and then back to the next one. What is the planned situation? And then you have here the number of additional persons again. And with that formula, you, re, you get the result, how much you have to strengthen the building. That means your existing building has 40%. With that additional persons you want to, with the flat put in the building, you have to reach the 44%. So that is mostly the task which has to be done. So that means if I put in one, we have the existing building, the resistance factor, number of additional persons, and a required resistance factor. And then we are calculating the resistance factor. Sorry, I did not translate that. Then we get a resistance factor after changing the building with the additional persons and additional loads from the attic story and then this must be fulfilled then this the authority will accept what i forgot to mention is that here it is important to know um, additional persons is only 50 percent more than existing in the existing building so that does not mean you can you can bring up more than five flats in that case extra. Okay, then I'm coming to two projects. This is a very typical one, which is now in the in the uh, authority uh, phase, the permission phase. This is like a typical building here. You see that existing situation. Uh, done in Trimuri and the mesh with the ground view and we could figure out here the the element wall which was here comes the building about 43 percent 44 percent of the earthquake and then the plan situation uh, the strengthening was the ceiling above the third floor because that was also of wooden beams and there will come a composite wooden beams concrete ceiling which is connecting all the inside walls then and can transport the shear forces from one wall to the to the next one and we can activate walls like this or like that and also of course there is a lift here in in concrete which will bring also a, a positive effect and then we are calculating that the plan situation and the same comes also building will same only loads will be changed and the lift is coming and and the ceiling and you will find the 
important element here and we can we could raise up around 10 percent the seismic resistance project two uh, is a little bigger one and has a longer history um you can see here a little bit on the photos what was the history they are built up here an antenna and then now it has to rebuild so that is also the existing situation you see here especially is that here in the in the in that story the there's a big hole you can say the these rooms are now around seven meters high or so and then we were again calculating that in the Trimuri. Found there was an existing concrete uh, shaft inside on the element. And then here, a lot of some more strengthening have been done, such as steel frames here in that areas. Ceilings, all ceilings were stiffened with either concrete slabs or composite wooden beams, concrete or solid timber boards or wooden beams. And also new shafts for lifts were built up inside and connected with the with concrete slabs to the rest of the building. And then it was also calculated again. You see the these lift shafts inside. And again, we got the after that, uh, the new seismic uh, resistance. Yeah, and some impressions of that building here, we can see that uh, we're building that massive steel frames. Also some injections in some areas with uh, in the masonry walls have done. And here you can see that the beams we leave inside the the wooden beams and strengthen it with other wooden beams and then above it it was coming a, a solid timber board connected with outside and inside walls yeah there were also done a lot of concrete works because that building had a uh, three basement floors which had which got the garage inside and then it is the building after all constructions were done how it is now so that is more or less on the end thank you very much um thank you very much to stadata and ingwer Ingwer, who the, which is the distributor of, of Trimui here, Austria, Germany, Switzerland, as far as I know. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Henning. I think that uh, also your presentation was really rich uh, of uh, very interesting information about, uh, in particular, the, the use of Trimui for these very uh, large buildings. Uh, which you have done uh, a lot of uh, say uh, um, diagnostic uh, and uh, modeling activities so you had, uh, you have a knowledge of these uh, of these structures and you have shown us that uh, they are uh, very let's say specific and with some features that are uh, uh, for, uh, what what i know so far very specific of this uh, context of the city of, of Vienna in particular, in Austria, but in particular the city of Vienna, I think. Uh, and I, I, what I would say is that uh, it is uh, very interesting also to see how uh, such, a large such large structures have been analyzed using a nonlinear analysis methodology, because actually, you have done no because it is simple using tremor you simply push a button but in the end you are performing a nonlinear analysis which can last say a okay. few minutes but actually in uh, in in this case i think uh, 
they did a, a great job. What I would uh, stress uh, in, in this case and in other cases is that when, once you have um, an analysis of uh, such a large building, you, you should and you probably have done, uh, uh, check the convergence of your analysis. So you can play with some analysis parameters and you can uh, verify if your solution is, uh, uh, say, uh, robust enough. I mean, in, in terms of uh, curves and damage uh, you get. Thank you again. Thank you. So I think uh, we can now move to the the next presenter. The next presenter is uh, uh, from Italy. She's uh, Romina Sisti. Uh, Romina is from uh, actually she's from me uh, from Umbria, if I'm not wrong. But uh, she is now working as postdoc at the University of Naples. Romina. Okay. Romina. Ciao Romina. Welcome. So uh, we cannot hear you so far. Good evening. Okay. Yeah. Good evening, Romina. Okay. So I can uh, leave you the, the floor for your presentation. Uh, I don't know uh, exactly what will be the topic of your presentation. I guess uh, it will be about the, the analysis work that have been done for the city of Camerino. Exactly. Okay. Um, so. Okay, we can see your screen. Okay. Uh -huh. Oh, I. Okay, we can see your um, the presenter view uh, instead. Of okay, the... okay. Well. While Romina is solving this technical issue, I, I can say that the, this uh, topic of uh, San Camerino is very interesting because the city of Camerino was completely closed after the earthquakes of, uh, of the stroke central Italy in 2016-17 uh, and it is really a very relevant work that what uh, so Romina is going to, to present because of, okay we can see the, uh, your presentation okay thank you okay okay so please So um, I'm going to present a recent work carried out in collaboration with the Italian Interuniversity Consortium Reluis. And in this work, we analyzed the seismic performance of four heritage buildings after the 2016 Central Italy earthquakes. And uh, today I'm going to show you one of these, the Palazzo Comunale located in uh, Camerino. Um, okay, Camerino uh, is a um, town of about 7,000 inhabitants and uh, is uh, situated on a hilly region of central Italy and his historic center um, stands on the top of one of these hills. Uh, this graph is taken from the Italian parametric earthquake catalog and uh, depicts the seismic history of Camerino. In particular, it shows the earthquakes that struck the town in the last uh, 1,000 years with an intensity greater than three, according to the mercalli cancani seberg uh, scale. And it's clear that several strong earthquakes struck the town in its history. And focusing on the last uh, 25 years, Camerino experienced two important seismic sequences. In 1997, the Umbria Marche sequence, and in 2016, the Central Italy seismic sequence. 
the last seismic sequence struck four regions of central Italy between August 2016 and January 2017. And in the figures, uh, the, um, the red stars mark the epicenters of the eight main uh, shocks. The first two events um, at the end of August didn't cause many, many damages in Camerino, while the three events at the end of October damaged many, many buildings. Uh, the maximum value of peak ground acceleration in uh, Camerino occurred during the um, earthquake of the 30th of October and was equal to 0 0.16 uh, times the gravity acceleration. And uh, in this shake map uh, is marked by the dark yellow, yellow color. Uh, Palazzo Comunale is a building in the historic center of Camerino, and before the 2016 earthquakes, it was um, used as a town hall. It's possible to, um, to find this ancient um, building, even in some uh, plants from the 13th century, when uh, it already shows the same uh, a uh, square shape and the same internal courtyard that we can observe now, nowadays. Um, as you can see from, from the map, Camerino is a part of a mesory complex, and that means it's part of a related group of buildings that were subjected to various transformations over the centuries. And in particular, in the west side of Palazzo Cam Comunale, there is a theater uh, called the Teatro Marchetti that was built in uh, 1728, uh, demolishing pre-existing structures. And Palazzo Comunale is a three floors building with an average floor um, surface of about 1,400 square meters. And the building is characterized by the presence uh, at the first floor of three state rooms with the double, a, double eyes, with, uh, and uh, with the Camorcana boats, uh, that are boats made of plaster and um, a reed straw uh, hanging from the um, wooden centering. Um, the presence of these, uh, of these uh, double eyed rooms cause uh, um, irregularities in elevation and um, strongly affect the plan layout uh, of the upper floors, splitting, splitting it in uh, two portions that don't communicate with each other. Uh, due to um, the seismic event of uh, 1997, the Palazzo Comunale suffered extensive damage mainly due to the poor quality of uh, masonry and the lack of wall-to-wall -wall connections. In particular, the activation of the, um, of the simple overturning of the main facade was the most insignificant um, damage. And on opposite, the continuous um, theater was not damaged at all. In order to um, repair the earthquake damages and improve the seismic behavior of Palazzo Comunales, um, strengthening measures were designed and realized uh, starting from 1999. In particular, uh, traditional strengthening techniques were adopted. Uh, the mechanical characteristics of um, all existing walls were improved by means uh, of um, growth injections. The wall irregularities were uh, reduced, walling up the um, wall niches or hollows. Uh, the bending capability of some masonry panels were increased, uh, inserting vertical tie roads. And uh, the original wooden floor or roof uh, were uh, either replaced, went too poor, or stiffened, went too flexible. And finally, the wall-to-wall -wall connections were improved, inserting uh, several tie roads. Um, the 2016 uh, event 
represented an opportunity to evaluate the effectiveness of the strengthening solution adopted in 1999. And for that reason, we carried out in situ um, surveys to detect the damage caused by the recent earthquake. And here you can see an example of one of the buildings plan uh, where the um, where we represented with uh, different uh, uh, red symbols the different type of damage, and um, uh, we um, we put blue marks. Uh, where we took uh, pictures to provide documentary evidence of the damage. Uh, I will show you a brief overview of the main uh, damages. Um, we observed some cracks uh, on the um, interface between the main facade and the boats uh, uh, at the ground at, and first floors, uh, but not damage was observed at the top floor. Um, so we can rule out the possibility that the main facade uh, or, uh, or a central portion of it uh, uh, was, subject, was subjected to a vertical overturning, while the um, vertical arch uh, mechanism may have been activated. Uh, Widespread millimetric cracks uh, were observed on the load-bearing walls, uh, whereas only a few cracks uh, involved the entire thickness of the, um, of the wall. And in these cases, there are often discontinuities in the measuring layout, like the one you, um, um, you can see in these pictures, that may have um, uh, facilitated the crack development. Uh, severe damage, uh, damages occurred in the non-structural components and in the stucco, deco stucco decorations. Um, sometimes uh, um, inadequate uh, construction details cause local damages, as in the case of the connection of these um, these wooden truss and the and the masonry underneath it. And uh, 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 the most severe damage was observed in the in the theater. Uh, where the external la layer of the masonry gable crumbled due to the poor quality of the masonry and caused the partial collapse uh, of the portion of the underlying roof structures. And in addition, the, the earthquake caused a disarrangement of the, um, of the theater's roof covering and um, unfortunately, the, um, the necessary countermeasures were realized only after, the, after three years. And so the rainwater uh, penetration led to the collapse of the Camorcana boats of the, in, in the gallery. Mm -hmm. So um, as um, as mentioned before, Palazzo Comunale is a part of a masonry complex. Uh, and uh, given the historical evolution of the complex and the structural morphology of the structural units that made, made it up, um, we decided to split the complex in four structural units having homogeneous characteristics and um, model each unit uh, individually rather than considering uh, the numerical analysis of the entire complex. Uh, so um, a 3D macro elements model has been used in order to simulate the seismic response uh, uh, and the damage pattern of the Palazzo Comunale. And the um, structural interaction, in, in interaction with um, neighboring structural units were considered uh, by the introduction of corresponding loading and boundary condition. Um, two different models were created to assess the seismic response uh, uh, of Palazzo Comunale before the renovation work and after the renovation work. 
We then compare the results obtained from these two models with the damage observed after the 1997 and uh, the uh, 2016 earthquakes, uh, respectively. Um, the mechanical properties of masonry wall were uh, assumed according to the values provided by the Italian code uh, for the um, masonry typologies detected, detected in, the Palazzo, in Palazzo Comunale while other material properties and the structural characteristics values uh, were uh, borrowed from the original project documents. Uh, okay, so to, to investigate the global response of the, of the building, um, simplified displacement-based procedure using a non-linear non -linear static analysis well, was performed and um, um, the model was loaded with a um, distribution of in-plane actions which were monotonically increased to um, simulate the effects of, of the inertia forces and two systems of lateral forces, forces distributions were applied, not uh, non simultaneously. In particular, um, the first distribution uh, was proportional to the displacement uh, of the corresponding for first model shape and uh, was, uh, was chosen since um, it was uh, representative of the behavior uh, of the structures in its original und um, undamaged configurations. And the second distribution was uh, proportional to the inertia masses uh, and it was uh, uh, more representative of the behavior of the structure at, at, uh, at collapse. And uh, as control node, it uh, was decided to adopt uh, the average displacement uh, of the nodes at, um, at the roof level. And uh, to, to express uh, in a concise way the results of the analysis related to the two models, I have reported only the values of the minimum seismic uh, safety index, the alpha parameter. Uh, defined as the ratio between uh, the maximum value of seismic acceleration corresponding to the attainment of the life safety performance level and the expected maximum acceleration prescribed by the Italian code. Uh, before renovation works, uh, Palazzo Comunale uh, exhibits a very poor performance uh, with a seismic safety index equal to 0 0.35. And um, as a result of um, sheer progressive failure of the peers. And um, uh, the 99, uh, the 1999 uh, renovation allowed to um, increase the safety index uh, and uh, mainly um, achieved thanks uh, to the improvement of measure quality and the reduction of uh, irregularities. And in both cases, the damage pattern uh, simulated by the software uh, are in good agreement with the um, damage pattern surveyed after the seismic events and um, showing that the software is a valid tool for the, um, for, for the safety assessment of um, the existing measure, the existing measure buildings. And um, regarding the results of the analysis related to model two that consider the Palazzo Comunale after the renovation work, we can note that uh, the seismic capacity corresponding to the attainment of life safety performance level is equal to 1.41. And um, the value is 65% uh, of the design value prescribed by the Italian code. And uh, the achievement of a capacity equal to 65% of the design actions was uh, exactly the design criterion adopted in the, um, in the project. Uh, so we can um, deduce, did, uh, deduce that uh, um, the results obtained with modern analysis uh, do not diverge, uh, diverge from uh, 
uh, those uh, obtained with the calculation methods available at the beginning of this century. And um, we can also compare the um, seismic capacity with the maximum value of peak ground acceleration occurred during the 2016 seismic sequence. Uh, and um, as you can see, uh, these uh, two values are, um, are very similar. In fact, the, um, the damage observed after the earthquake uh, perfectly um, coincide uh, with the definition of the life safety performance level. And um, as you know, uh, the, the, um, the pushover analysis just presented takes into account only the in-plane behavior of the masonry panel. And um, it is necessary uh, to analyze uh, the out-of-plane uh, response of the walls and verify the activation of uh, local uh, collapse um, mechanisms. And for this purpose, um, the, um, a, a macro element approach based on the um, theorems of limit analysis was, uh, was used. And each mechanism uh, involves uh, only single masonry panel or an isolated portion of the buildings that are um, considered structurally independent from the rest of the building and are modeled as a set of uh, rigid blocks uh, connected with uh, hinges. And these figures show the seven, um, the seven mechanisms uh, analyzed, analyzed, and um, uh, uh, which were defined according to the um, construction details and um, construction details such as uh, existing wall-to-wall -wall connections or wall-to-floor connections or structural discontinuities. And um, the table uh, shows the results uh, of the analysis and uh, reports the, for each uh, mechanism uh, the seismic capacity for the life, um, for the life safety performance level and the related uh, safety index. And uh, as you can see, before renovation, many, many mechanisms uh, were characterized by a safety index lower than, uh, than one, while the introduction of many steel tie roads allowed to prevent the activation of all mechanisms considered. And um, that demonstrates the effectiveness of this type of strengthening intervention in, the, in, in uh, encountering out-of-plane uh, behavior. Um, so in conclusion, um, the damage analysis of Palazzo Comunale and Teatro Marchetti uh, reveal uh, the importance of properly improving the measure quality in order to avoid the crumbling of some wall panels. Um, the critical role played by construction details to prevent local damages and the importance of ensure, ensuring a faster realization of the short-term countermeasures. And um, the 2016 earthquake caused less severe damages, damages in Palazzo Comunale compared to the ones uh, due to the, um, the 1997 event, uh, showing that in case of extensive intervention on, on both vertical and horizontal structures, reduced damage level can be achieved uh, even for heritage and uh, irregular buildings like the one we analyzed. And um, in fact, the, the, renovation, carry, the renovation work um, significantly increased the seismic capacity of the Palazzo Comunale. Um, and in, as shown by the results of the numerical analysis uh, um, that are in uh, good agreement with the damage observed after the, the earthquakes. So 
Thank you for your attention and uh, thank you Stradata for um, to invite me in this meeting. Really, thank you, Romina, because uh, I think your presentation was uh, very, very interesting as uh, uh, the previous were, but in particular in, in your case, uh, I think you have uh, stressed many uh, aspects that uh, deal with the, uh, the confidence we can have with these tools uh, when we apply them to the uh, assessment of uh, of uh, existing uh, structures. Uh, another topic that you have stressed, and I think uh, it is common uh, somehow to what was introduced by Henning uh, Kims, uh, was that also in, in your case you 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 have uh, you had the possibility of assessing the uh, partial compliance provided by the intervention uh, in uh, formed after the. The, the event of 1997, and in this case, uh, you, we have unfortunately the test of those interventions. So, in uh, also from this uh, point of view, this uh, presentation was very, very interesting. Now I have to to move to the, the next uh, presentation, which is mine, and uh, I hope uh, will not be too much boring because uh, we are a little late. I try to to stay in 20 minutes or. Uh, or so, say. Okay, can you, I hope you can see my screen. Okay, and the title is uh, quite general. Uh, the, uh, the topic is uh, what we have seen so far. So the assessment of existing buildings using pushover analysis. Uh, and existing measure buildings are those that better uh, suit this uh, this approach of uh, linear analysis uh, applied to the assessment of their capacity because they are intrinsically non-linear. Their behavior is non-linear since the beginning, since the early uh, deformations. And we have stressed uh, also in this uh, last presentation of uh, Romina, but in the previous as well. Uh, I can remember those of uh, Rita Bento, of uh, Alexandre Costa, Alessandro Marasca, and, and the others. This issue of this local uh, mechanism that can be uh, prevented uh, using the suitable uh, devices that uh, connect uh, perpendicular walls and walls to floors to, um, to contrast this mechanism. And, uh, uh, and allow the activation of a global response, a global behavior, which is governed by the world in plane response, and then uh, which is also uh, ruled by this in plane stiffness of the diaphragms. I will start with this, uh, let's say, video in which you can see two stages of one recent test that we have performed in, uh, in, uh, in Pavia on this. Uh, so reduce scale to um, building aggregate, measure building aggregate is representative. It was meant to be representative of a, of a situation typical of a historic center in, uh, in Switzerland, in the city of Basel. And you can see uh, you, from the uh, video on, the, on your left that the local mechanism was actually activated from in this part with the say, starting of uh, overturning of this part. But then once we had activated all two diaphragm connections and these tire roads, then we could move on and continue to a much higher level of uh, acceleration, preventing this mechanism and then activating, uh, say, I would say activating a lot, the in-plane damage and the in-plane response and then the in-plane damage of the walls parallel to the shaking direction. Uh, this was a stone uh, measurable. Uh, the use of pushover analysis uh, is, uh, you know, pushover is a uh, nonlinear static analysis which uh, allows uh, carrying uh, uh, static analysis. Uh, so we accept that uh, in the calculation of the, the displacement demand, we will use some simplified uh, 
um, formulae, uh, but we can uh, identify the evolution of uh, strength with the lateral deformation, and we can identify potential uh, uh, mechanisms and uh, fragile uh, elements. Uh, we can say predict the, the, the localization of the formation demand in specific elements and we can then uh, you can then uh, try uh, to um, let's say target our interventions to improve uh, all these uh, characteristics so we can uh, we need some tools to do this uh, kind of uh, analysis and we can apply this uh, analysis uh, both to global uh, the global response of buildings or to the, the response of specific walls if the stiffness of floors uh, is not allowing a uh, uh, global box type behavior. The idea is that we apply a system of horizontal forces to, uh, to a structure which can be also transformed into an equivalent single degree of freedom system. We use this uh, bilinear approximation typically, which is then uh, the basis for uh, uh, computing not only the capacity but also the uh, demand uh, in the sense that we can use the bilinear uh, formula uh, uh, parameters to um, to compute the displacement demand in this case you see the what is reported in euro code 8 uh, which is the uh, famous formula by professor Pfeiffer and what, also, what is also relevant is that uh, the pushover analysis provides, uh, I would say, the evolution of, of capacity with, um, with increased lateral displacement, but also the, it allows to, to check the spread of damage and the peak of damage uh, for increasing displacement. In this sense, it is uh, widely recognized that the displacement, the lateral displacement in particular, is a good uh, measure of uh, damage is a good proxy of um, of damage, so we can uh, easily uh, use this global displacement as a measure of um, the, the damage levels for different limit states. And in particular, you can see in this case you can identify these points uh, on the capacity curve, uh, identifying the um, different limit states, uh, which can be operational, uh, slight, uh, moderate, uh, or severe, or near collapse limit states, depending on the codes and depending on definitions that the code provide with this, for, this, uh, um, for these damage states. Uh, I was saying before that uh, we need a tool, a computational model uh, for running a pushover analysis of measure structures. Uh, there are many characteristics that you can see uh, are listed here um, that this uh, tool should uh, um, fulfill. And so they, they, they have to comply with all the failure modes and of all stru structural members that are included in, in the model, can be, which can be included in the model. And these... Uh, um, Failure modes uh, are associated with strength criteria that are uh, depending on the different codes. So this, uh, from this point, but also not, but not only from, for, from this point, the tools need to be um, to be flexible enough itself. So to, to accommodate for different code regulations and code uh, settings that can be different. Uh, it, it has to satisfy local and global equilibrium. Uh, it looks uh, an obvious statement, this one, but uh, I can guarantee it is not. In, I'm not talking about Remuri, obviously, but, but there are uh, other codes or other approaches which are not respecting equilibrium. Um, uh, it has to, to provide a reasonable compromise between accuracy uh, simplicity of use and the capability of interpretation in, in interpretation of the of the results. Uh, 
it also allows to identify the damage thresholds uh, starting from the damage you observe in the different members and then you can report as a global condition for for the for the model this is a, a picture i prepared a number of years ago i always like it because uh, it is uh, somehow clarifying what is uh, a pushover analysis or a pullover analysis uh, because uh, it is a system of forces that are applied to uh, you know, a system of in general uh, generally speaking horizontal forces that are applied to um, to a structure to the nodes of a, of a structure and they are increased until uh, the, the the lateral, the lateral capacity increases when we increase the lateral displacement but then the uh, when this uh, car is uh, continuing to to move the, to to increase the, the, the lateral displacement uh, it, it can occur it you it uh, uh, normally occurs that uh, at a certain point the, cap the, the strength capacity uh, is reached and then if we increase the displacement, the lateral strength decreases. And it is very important that you also follow that uh, softening branch of the curve. So that we follow the curve, the evolution of the lateral uh, capacity once the, um, the, the lateral strength is, uh, is no more increasing, but can increase with the increase, the increase in displacement. It is uh, helpful to, um, to identify properly uh, limit states, but it also uh, important. It is also important to uh, consider an important part of the structural capacity before collapse. Uh, in terms of results of a pushover analysis, we have the evolution of the base shear, which is the sum of the of all these forces that are applied, uh, and it is expressed in as a function of uh, one displacement, which can be a real displacement, typically uh, displacement of, of one node at the, uh, at the top story, or can be a virtual displacement, which can be, for instance, a combination of displacement at the um, at the given uh, story, it can be the, usually the top one, uh, in case of a very flexible diaphragm, for instance. Starting from these uh, analysis, we get the capacity curve, and then the capacity curve can be transformed. And it, after this transformation, which uh, in the end mm, results in the capacity curve in a special uh, uh, diagram with spectral acceleration, spect spectral displacement, the curve can be approximated by a bilinear uh, curve, which is helpful to. Uh, com compute the displacement demand. The different code provide different solutions for for this uh, last step. And we will see that in some cases they are very uh, different and can provide different uh, uh, results. And uh, the result that Alessandro Malasca was showing about the, the Netherlands uh, are uh, actually related to one of these uh, cases in which the uh, this the, the original version of this Dutch code uh, refer to a very conservative prediction of uh, of displacement demand. The equivalent frame uh, approach is something that we have developed uh, following uh, first of all observation, and if you watch at the damage after the main uh, earthquakes in. Um, in areas where we have uh, mesory buildings, uh, the last relevant one is the one in Croatia, uh, we can notice that damage is typically concentrated in specific elements. In particular, you can see that this damage concentration in piers, in some cases, in spandrels, or a mix of damage in piers and spandrels. But these elements are those where typically where we have uh, damage concentration. And this allows to uh, idealize uh, the lateral in-plane behavior of a, of a wall with openings as the one of an equivalent frame structure. 
a structure with vertical elements which are coinciding with the piers, horizontal elements which are typically spandrel uh, beams or other beams that can be present, for instance, concrete beams, or concrete beams representing um, the um, out of plane stiffness of floors. So we we have these uh, mechanisms uh, which are uh, somehow um, reported in some codes, for instance, some codes in the, in the US, which uh, divide this uh, behavior in, uh, in this soft story mechanism or peer mechanism and this uh, spandrel mechanism. We know that re in reality, and in particular in the case of irregular buildings, we typically have a mix of damage, which of course, both in uh, peers and in spandrels. And this is also the, this is the result of observation, but this is also the result of uh, experimental and numerical evidence, as you can see from the uh, figures on, on the right. The identification of uh, an equivalent frame model uh, uh, from the geometry of a facade can be a, let's say, almost automatic and uh, trivial uh, operation, or can be a an operation that which needs uh, the specification of uh, clear steps. Uh, in particular, you can see from this uh, uh, plot uh, what is the um, let's say the rationale followed in in Tremuri for this uh, identification. You first identify spandrels, then piers, and then the remaining parts are assumed to be the rigid nodes, the rigid portion of measure which are connected with the nodes of the frame. Which is the uh, which is represented in the figure on on the right here. You can see here, and this is uh, somehow simple, very simple in the case of uh, regularly distributed openings. Uh, even if uh, in, when you are close to the um, the ends of the of the wall, then you uh, may uh, need to use uh, some rules that increase uh, the effective height of these of these piers, and this also can be depending on dependent on the on the type of uh, lintels you have in uh, above your 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 windows or your wall or your doors, because if you have um, uh, lintels that are very well connected and uh, deeply um, connected into the, um, the piers, you cannot have a crack starting from this point, but then uh, you tend to have a, a lateral pill uh, um, height, which is the same of the, uh, of the neighbor opening. In case of irregularly distributed uh, openings, then you can still uh, manage to identify uh, um, an equivalent frame uh, uh, topology. For instance, in this case, you can see uh, that the, we have a, a misaligned uh, window with respect to the um, door at the, um, at the lower story. Uh, the, in this case, it is uh, missing the window, so we have uh, three piers at the um, the first story and two uh, piers at the second story. So it is a very say irregular uh, condition that we can manage to um, continue analyzing in uh, in an equivalent frame uh, approach with some say effort. But uh, it is completely automatic now in uh, in Tremuri, and you have used many times. Uh, and we have seen uh, the application of these uh, principles also in uh, in the case of many of the presentation that we could uh, um, uh, watch um, before. Uh, all the uh, main failure uh, mechanisms and uh, associated strength criteria need to be implemented in uh, in these models. So we have to. Um, to consider the potential occurrence of uh, bending, rocking with the toe crashing, uh, 
diagonal shear, diagonal tension shear mechanism, uh, and uh, shear sliding uh, with, with uh, horizontal or step uh, cracks, uh, which can be also ruled by the cracking occurring at the uh, uh, at the two extreme of the of the pier. So uh, the the response, the lateral response of the piers can be uh, very simplified, but in uh, in the the model you have to properly uh, introduce all these uh, criteria, which interact each other. And uh, the common uh, uh, aspect of all these uh, criteria, which is uh, a typical feature of uh, of measuring elements, but not, not only measuring elements, is that the lateral strength is strongly depending on the applied vertical load. And so we can have a different uh, behavior and different governing uh, um, failure modes and then strength criteria, strength criteria depending on the level of uh, axial force acting in, uh, in, uh, on the pier. And this is an example of uh, what happens in, uh, for instance, one pier of uh, one building, and the model need to be able to uh, to go, um, to reproduce this kind of uh, effect. So when we push this uh, wall from uh, left to right, then we have a variation of the axial forces. So we typically have an increase. Uh, of the forces on this side and the decrease from on, on this side. So when we are in this part of the um, of the diagram of the interaction di di diagram uh, uh, between uh, the axial force and shear force, we, we see that we are governed by this uh, uh, line, which uh, is associated with, in this case, with the diagonal uh, cracking. And uh, when we, but if you what if you look at what happens in the other piece, the situation is different. And if we push the, the, this wall from from right to left, uh, this piece becomes uh, um, a piece with a lower uh, axial force, and the governing criteria change changes. And then, and then so we have we need a criterion in which uh, the peers is able to uh, account for this effect and uh, consider it in in uh, in the mechanism that is activated and the displacement capacity which is um, associated with the different mechanisms. Here you see another an example of a picture that uh, I took casually in uh, uh, after the Emilia 2012 event, you see these cracks in, in this wall. But looking at these cracks, you can identify that some of them are associated with bending rocking. Uh, and you see this, uh, there is an horizontal crack here, a diagonal crack here. And, and this here, uh, in this pier, you can see when the inertial forces act from uh, left to right, was corresponding to a shear failure. But the contrary happens in uh, uh, when the forces act in the other direction. And in electric loading, this always happens. And then you can see that there, there are different high effective height, but also different failure modes depending on this, um, on, the, on the pushing direction. The other important aspect that I need to be uh, covered by your tool is the capability of analyzing floor uh, diaphragm considering their actual stiffness. And this is a relevant aspect because uh, this uh, in plane stiffness of the diaphragm governs the lateral um, spread of uh, forces and uh, sharing of forces of horizontal forces among walls in a in a pushover or in a dynamic analysis. Uh, the membrane model, uh, which is implemented in, uh, in Tremuri, is governed by a few parameters, which can be, uh, let's say, obtained uh, automatically from 
uh, homogenization in the simple cases or can be um, user defined if we consider for instance uh, more refined models for uh, the in-plane stiffness of uh, uh, of timber uh, uh, diaphragms considering the, the effect of uh, the nail stiffness or you can use um, say codified approaches still analytical in the case of the uh, New Zealand uh, code or say more uh, say rough but practical in the case of the um, US uh, codes. What you see in uh, this uh, plot instead is the uh, same application which is a, a little false but again still applicable uh, in the case of vaults, uh, we, we see that uh, different vaults can be associated with an equivalent membrane with nonlinear characteristics. Uh, what is uh, still missing, we hope uh, we, we will be able to, um, to introduce in the future version, is also some uh, displacement or deformation capacity to be associated with this uh, with this uh, kind of equivalent diaphragm, because in the case of um, timber diaphragm, of course, we have a nonlinear behavior, but it is typically associated with the larger in-plane displacement. In the case of vaults, we can have a fragility of these elements uh, when they are uh, subject to in-plane distortion. The other thing is that uh, in case of very flexible diaphragm, the model allows to uh, perform analysis of uh, single walls. And it is generally correct in the sense that uh, if uh, wall to diaphragm and wall to wall connections are effective, then we can assume that uh, out of plane uh, displacements are prevented. We saw it in uh, in the video in uh, the beginning of this presentation, uh, but still we cannot uh, count on uh, any coupling effect of the flows uh, in uh, um, transmitting forces from one uh, one wall to the uh, to the other. So we can uh, uh, work on uh, different on this kind of uh, let's say uh, sub uh, structures uh, which are the in-plane. Uh, uh, analysis of walls, but when we do this, uh, we should also account to properly um, um, computation of tributary vertical loads and masses, uh, in particular inertial masses that uh, need to be um, properly evaluated uh, in the case of uh, in-plane uh, um, single wall analysis. Uh, the tie effect of flows, because uh, if flows are connected, they maybe are not um, providing a, um, a, a sufficient shear stiffness, uh, which allows to couple the, uh, the, the displacement of uh, different walls, but uh, it can couple the displacement of the different nodes um, of the uh, of, of the consider wall at this uh, at, at the same uh, level and it should be also accounted for the tie uh, for the flange effect uh, of portion of the perpendicular walls uh, that can transform these um, measuring portion in uh, collaborating portions if the connection is uh, is suitable this is an application uh, to a building in, uh, in Basel in which we try to consider the effect of different uh, interventions on, uh, on the in-plane stiffness of, uh, of floors using the Tremuri program. This is the, the building. Uh, as you can see, in my case study is not as well. Um, and uh, uh, appealing as the, the ones that were presented by by the previous speakers, but uh, the idea is to compare the model with very flexible uh, diaphragms. So basically, uh, uh, the, the initial condition 
then moderately flexible flows well, when we possibly we have some stiffening effect of uh, double layer mesh for planks uh, and pavements then we have a uh, an intermediate case of uh, stiffening diaphragms with uh, uh, say multi-layer spruce ply plywood panels uh, so some timber-based uh, um, interventions and these almost uh, infinitely rigid uh, uh, flaws uh, obtained by applying um, a collaborating RC lab uh, stiff enough as uh, in some of the interventions presented in for instance, uh, those uh, about the, the Vienna buildings. What you see is that uh, model analysis is providing some uh, results in which uh, for very flexible diaphragms, we typically have uh, independent modes uh, for, the, um, for the different uh, walls, whereas for the rigid uh, diaphragms, we tend to have a, a, a global um, uh, response. And this is also clearly check in uh, in the percentage of uh, participation participating masses which is uh, um, 46 percent in the flexible uh, diaphragm case and goes up almost to 90 percent in the rigid diaphragm case and these are the curves and the you can see that uh, there is a significant increase in terms of uh, um, lateral strength uh, when we move from the flexible diaphragm to the uh, rigid one, or at least stiff ones, uh, which is a, a demonstration that in this case, we have a collaboration um, in between the different uh, walls, which is enforced by the presence of these stiff uh, elements. Uh, these are some uh, results uh, from nonlinear dynamic analysis, which were performed on the same uh, buildings. I will go uh, quickly on, on this. But what is interesting is that uh, in terms of uh, comparison between pushover and uh, nonlinear dynamic analysis uh, uh, in, the, in terms of um, displacement shapes, then we see that uh, even in, uh, in the case of uh, quite flexible diaphragms, in this case at least, uh, the approximation of the, the displacement and the, or the deflected shape is uh, quite good in um, in case of a pushover analysis performed on a on a large building uh, like this instead of performing the analysis on the on the single walls uh, separately. The point is that uh, the not only the displacement shape but also the displacement demand is. Uh, say approximately well uh, captured but in some cases depending on the on the um, uh, load pattern adopted for the pushover analysis we have uh, uh, better or uh, worse uh, approximation and this uh, say leads to the last point of this uh, of this presentation is which is related to the to the approximation we have in uh, uh, intrinsically in the use of uh, nonlinear pushover and nonlinear static analysis, which is the computation of the displacement demand. Uh, as I was uh, mentioning before, when we use a, a sim uh, simplification like this, we uh, we need to use um, either an overdamping uh, approach, which is the one embedded in the capacity spectrum method uh, or we can use in elastic uh, spectra which is uh, a spectral reduction accounting for the, the activity this is a comparison uh, specific for the dutch uh, code which uh, allows the use of the capacity spectrum method and you can see that uh, the conservatism of this code can be uh, clearly seen from from this thick black line in which we see that the prediction is systematically um, the, the mean the median prediction is systematically larger than the, uh, the one obtained from uh, nonlinear term history analysis 
which could be okay, apart from the fact that the scatter of these results is huge. So when we compare nonlinear static and nonlinear um, dynamic analysis, we can see that there is a, a significant uh, uh, scatter using this procedure. And this is uh, something that we can also um, observe, in particular the scatter issue, for the uh, improved formulation, which is pre presented, there is an error here. This is, the, this is not the NPR, this is the FEMA, uh, is the US uh, code uh, presenting the same, uh, say, theoretically the same approach with some improved coefficients, and in particular with an improved relation in between the spectral reduction factor and activity. So in the end, we, there is a, this use of overdamped spectra. But in the end, the, this, over -damp this damping uh, is derived from ductility. And this is something that, uh, in the end, probably, um, say, uh, goes in the direction of using other formulations, which uh, directly make use of, um, of, uh, of ductility uh, for the reduction of uh, uh, the displacement so for the for the increase of the displacement demand by correcting the, the ductility demand and this is uh, the formulation which is provided in Eurocode 8 which derives from the um the FIFAR uh, proposal and this is a more recent proposal that we have been working on uh from let's say using Tremuri as a say a linear analysis tool for uh, analyzing a number of uh, um, uh, systems also characterized by um, short period structure, which is the typical condition of, of measure buildings. And in this, in this case, we can see that uh, we can uh, uh, correct uh, this trend, which is again uh, conservative for the, for the lower displacement demand levels, but that becomes un unconservative in the higher uh, displa in the displacement and activity demand where it should be more. Uh, this is the result of the modified uh, N2 method. And in particular, this is uh, what happens uh, in, uh, in the case of uh, short period uh, structures. You can see that there is a, a, a black line which is not exactly aligned with the B sectors of this uh, um, the sector of this uh, diagram, which should be the ideal case, it is still uh, conservative, but not that scattered as is uh, in the in the previous case. And this is the comparison uh, again in the case of natural or induced seismicity, and you see that the results are basically the same, at least at, up to um, an activity level of four. Then. Uh, we can notice a small uh, deviation from the, the B sector. This is this, the plot we have seen before. So I thank you for your kind attention. I hope uh, also this uh, final uh, presentation, which was not as nice as the previous one, but uh, I think uh, it has been uh, quite, uh, say, um, interesting to have something different uh, at the end. So I think that uh, we can consider that uh, after uh, almost three hours uh, and a half, uh, we, we have provided uh, some information. Sh surely we, have, uh, we had the opportunity of uh, watching uh, very different cases, very interesting uh, cases, palaces, uh, marvelous uh, uh, opportunities of, uh, of research uh, and application. Um, uh, to work on uh, very different um, uh, heritage structures, ordinary buildings, ordinary buildings, but with very extraordinary details, as the one uh, of uh, of uh, Groningen. Uh, the characteristics of this uh, important part of the building stock in Vienna, the 
the specific uh, case of the the building in the coast island uh, in which uh, we we could see not only the, the application of the building but the complex application of the code in that case uh, to the to the building to the assessment and retrofit of the of the building uh, the the extraordinary case of the Sintra Palace and the uh, uh, very nice applications uh, both to Camerino and to the several uh, cases presented by NCREP uh, from uh, Action Cost. So I thank you all the uh, audience for uh, resisting until uh, uh, this time and all the speakers for their very, very interesting presentations. Thank you. I think then we can now close the session and Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay.